Everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, to the representative from embassies and um, and friends, um, I won't be uh, talking too much. Um, I'm here as an MC wearing two hats as well as the moderator. Uh, but uh, first, I I would say that um, I would say why do we have this uh, uh, talk in the first place? Um, as you all very know, well very know that uh, recently there have been a lot of talk about our federal constitution uh, with the recent conversion case um, as well as the arrest uh, of some of our NGOs who uh, showed a movie on uh, Sri Lanka. So the, these freedoms, uh, do we have real freedom? Uh, so basically this, uh, we have very esteemed uh, speakers uh, to talk on the what they think our con uh, constitution is, and uh, and we will have plenty of time for uh, participants to ask questions uh, to our speakers, um, and uh, feel free to ask uh, anything that you are not clear about on any issue because uh, constitution is very wide, so there are many things that I, I, I I'm sure people would like to know. Um, I would also like to mention uh, for some, to some, uh, there are some participants here, and they are not here as well, who have donated some money for us to eat, <laughs> for the makan. So the money is not from the bar. The money for the makan is from some kind donations uh, from individuals. Uh, they support uh, this talk, uh, so they uh, they wanted to feed the participants. So thank you to the donators. Um, I also would like to <clears throat> mention about because uh, before anybody raised the issue, I would also like to say that uh, as organized, uh, we are the organizer. We have such difficulties uh, to get um, speakers uh, from very uh, uh, background. Uh, we tried very hard uh, to get speakers from the opposite views, um, meaning that uh, whoever think that it is actually the constitution is Islamic uh, and the country is Islamic. So, but we have tried so many, but unfortunately, none of them taken up the offer. So that just to make that clear, because uh, some people might actually. Uh, make comments on that one, why aren't we getting the other side of the view? Uh, we did try very hard until yesterday, in fact, uh, but without success. So therefore, we, we actually thank for to the speakers who uh, I will introduce you uh, later on, uh, as soon as they start. Uh, another thing, just to mention before I forget, to lawyers and pupils, if there are any lawyers here, please make sure you sign out when you leave because otherwise you will not get your CPD points. Um, so therefore, we are now done with the introduction. Uh, I will go straight uh, to introducing, introducing the speaker. Uh, you can see on the program, uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Ahmad Farouk. Dr. Ahmad Farouk. Uh, Dr. Farouk is uh, actually from Islamic Renaissance Front. I shall read briefly his uh, bio here. Uh, he is an academician at Monash University. He is a trained cardiothoracic, I don't know, I can't pronounce this word, cardiothoracic, is it? Yes, <laughs> surgeon and a researcher in the field of cardiac surgery. So I know who to go if I have some problem with my heart. Huh? So he has been actively involved uh, in social work uh, since his student days in promoting the establishment of civil society. He is a founding member of Muslims Professionals Forum and currently the founder and chairman of Islamic Renaissance Front, the newly launched intellectual movement and a think tank focusing on youth empowerment and promotion of intellectual discourse and reformation. So without further ado, I invite Dr. Farouk uh, to talk on what he thinks, whether our constitution is secular or not. Dr. Farouk.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, Madam Chairman, Madam Chairperson, uh, my esteemed colleagues, viewers, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, forum. Basically, we're discussing about uh, our constitution, and uh, as you know, that this is a very hot topic. Uh, nowadays, uh, everybody seems to uh, have an interest about what is happening and what is going on, what is the future direction of our country with the recent things that are happening and I think everybody is worried where are we heading well as in, an introduction I think uh, that we have to take this uh, uh, fact in, into consideration there is uh, our former Prime Minister to Mahathir in 2001 that Amna wishes to state that clearly that Malaysia is an Islamic nation. This is based on the opinion of the ulama who had clarified what have, what constitute uh, constituted an Islamic country. Because basically he uh, basically he was trying to say that a loose definition of what an Islamic country is all about is when it is predominantly inhabited by Muslims, then it is an Islamic country. Yes, the a uh, very loose definition of an Islamic country and it is acceptable, an acceptable definition of what constitutes an Islamic country. However, there are limits, okay, and um, uh, whether this country is uh, basically an Islamic country or not and we should not basically uh, accept uh, what has been said by our former Prime Minister um, as basically, you know, uh, hard and fast truth that uh, cannot be debated at all. So now, if you look at uh, Article 4 of the Constitution, and I believe that um, all of you are aware of that, uh, this, uh, this Constitution is, uh, the, our Constitution is basically the supreme law of the Federation. The supreme law of the Federation is the Constitution, and not the Quran, all right? And any law passed after America Day which is on inconsistent with this Constitution, shall to the extent of the inconsistency be void. This is a very important statement. Of course, if you look at our constitution and we see that, you know, race and religion uh, basically littered the document, all right? But we have to understand that the reason was because of the situation at that time, uh, during independence, right? When the Malays were very backward. And I think it was more of a stopgap measure, right? Rather than to be a perpetual thing. Uh, throughout the ages. As I said, yeah, uh, this is because of the, you know, um, the feeling of wealth, uh, in both in numbers and in economic disparity, as I said just now. Right? So, but if you were to examine the constitution as a whole, then, and study behind uh, the seeming paradox, why there are certain uh, privileges to the Muslims and to the Buddhists, for example, they will discover that at the heart of this supreme law and the founding fathers lay a desire to create a pluralistic and equal society. Right? So the question is, they had that intention, but why? Where did it all go wrong? That's the most important question that we have to ask. Now, look at Article 3 of the constitution. It reads, Islam is a religion of the federation, but other religions may be practiced in peace and harmony in any part of the tradition. Now, does this phrase mean that Malaya was to be an Islamic state? To me, to me as a lay person, as not a trained lawyer, I would say that it is not supposed to be that way, not to be interpreted or to be read in that sense. Right? There are two main reasons for it. All right? One, based on the report of the Federation of Malaya Constitutional Commission, page 73, the read commission, report upon examining the draft constitution, the draft constitution says, the observance of this principle shall not imply that the state is not a secular state. And that was a statement made by the read commission. All right? So, we have to understand that it wasn't only an assertion made by the Red Commission, 
right? But it was basically the assertion made by the people in power at that time, okay? That we have to understand, that the, our founding fathers really wanted this constitution to be a secular constitution, and this country to be a secular country. All right, and this statement combined with Article 4, which places all laws in the country under constitution, means that any claim that Malaya was meant to be theocratic is indigenous. Right? Okay. Now, basically this is probably the bone of contention among the various groups in Malaysia. There is the Article 3. Article 3 says that Islam is the religion of the Federation. Okay? However, Article 3 was taken to mean that as far as official ceremonial matters are concerned, Islamic form and rituals are to be used. It means that in any official functions, if you were to start the function by reciting a dua, it must be an Islamic recitation of the dua and not other religions. Right? So that's that's what it's supposed to mean. Right? So secondly, um, in a long, in a landmark case of uh, Choma Ben so I think everybody is uh, basically uh, familiar with this uh, uh, with this case versus public prosecutor. The Supreme Court at the time, okay, held that laws in Malaysia do not have to conform to the Islamic principles and confirm that Malaysia is a secular state. I think. Most of you are aware of this uh, case. It was basically a drug trafficker, and uh, he, I think he was uh, um, uh, appealing for his case. And um, I think his lawyer, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, Ramdas Tikamdas at that time. So he was facing a mandatory life sentence. So the argument made by Ramdas Tikamdas is that, you know, a drug trafficker, according to Islamic law, should not be punished by death. So it's against the Islamic Islamic law, Islamic precepts. And since uh, Islam is uh, uh, considered the um, uh, religion of the Federation, then this law is null and void. Right? So that was the argument by Ram Das Tikam Das. Right? However, um, is uh, the Lord President, you see, the Lord President at that time, in a landmark ruling said that we have to set aside our personal feelings because the law in this country is still what it is today, a secular law, where morality not accepted by the law is not enjoying the status of the law. And that's the most important thing. Huh? Very clear judgment by the then Lord President. As I said just now, our constitution provides that Article 4 is the highest law of the land. Whereas, as far as we know, in any Islamic state, they say that the highest law in the land should be the Quran and nothing else. Right? Now, look at Article 11. Yeah, Article 11 has been like uh, Malik Mtias and many others that we have been, you know, like discussing and fighting about regarding this article, right? I think it started with the case of Lina Joy. Article 11. Every person has the right Every person has the right to profess and practice the religion and subject to Clause 4 to propagate it. Now, Clause 4 allows the state government and the federal government, in the case of federal territories, to control the propagation of religion to Muslims. Now, this is probably a very contentious issue, all right? This Clause 4. Because, because the existence of this clause <coughs> has made any kind of proselytization to the Muslims are unlawful, right? And if you understand 
this, this is in fact, it's not limited to non-Muslims trying to propagate their beliefs to Muslims, but also another Muslim to propagate his views to other, to other Muslims as well. So, <laughs> I would like you to recall what happened in, if I'm not mistaken, 2008, right? The former uh, Mufti of Portlis, um, Ustaz Asri, right? He was being, uh, being apprehended by uh, Jais um, on the charge that he was trying to propagate Wahhabi Salafi teaching. So meaning to say that in this country, there's only one version of Islam. That is the Jaqim and Jai's version of Islam. <laughs> no other version of Islam are acceptable. No, not even Wahhabi Salafis. Not even the, of course, the Shiites. They were being discriminated. They were, their houses were being raided. They were being put under ISA. And uh, you know, all, all kind of things, they were being demonized. And like the, like, if you look on Facebook, for example, then you see that you know people are saying that they should be killed. You know, this kind of kind of hatred speech you find in Malaysia because of this. This idea of institutionalized Islam, I think this is a very important issue that we have to address and we have to discuss and debate. Right? Because how can there be just a single version of Islam? Right? One single version of Islam and anything else is unacceptable. It is ridiculous. So, for example, Harding suggests that the restriction of proselytism has more to do with the preservation of public order than religious priority. Yeah? If you look at that book. And um, if you look even at Article, at article 8 itself, it lays down the principles and the ideas, ideal, the, down the ideal of equality. That is, all persons are equal before the law and entitled to the equal protection of the law. Right? Alright. Now, if we look at this uh, Read Commission report again, alright, it says that in an independent layer, all nationals should be accorded equal rights, privileges, and opportunities, and there must not be discrimination on grounds of race and creed. Now, let us ask ourselves, do we feel that, you know, in Malaysia that all of us are equal? <laughs> no. Definitely, like, I think most non-Muslims, most of my friends, they consider themselves as second-class citizens third in this class. country. Third class. <laughs> yeah, maybe third class, right? <laughs> Muslims who do not subscribe to, to the Jaqim and uh, Jais uh, Islam are considered basically heretics, right? Uh, and worse still, if you are Shiites, then you are considered uh, as the number one enemy. And this sectarian kind of politics are being brought about, brought to this country by these uh, Salafi Wahhabi scholars from Saudi Arabia, for example. And you know, like how they perpetuated the, um, this kind of war, civil war in Syria, for example, and it has somehow turned to become a sectarian war, right, between Sunnis and Shias. And this is very bad. And the thing is going to happen over here as well if we do not try and put a stop to it. Okay, uh, I'll skip that, that point over there. Let's go to... Alright. So it is said that the constitution was designed, our constitution, to, to be one that supported fundamental liberal democratic principles. Okay? It acknowledges the iniquity that existed in Malaya of 1907, and it also makes certain that the traditional values of the Malays were given a special place. All right? But the rulers were considered monarch with limited real power, but tremendous symbolic strength. And Islam was given special symbolic recognition as well as real authority over personal laws of Muslims. It's just over personal matters, okay? About marriage, about inheritance, and so on and so forth. Right? I have problems if people's were trying to impose, right, 
that you know they must in order for us to achieve uh, basically a status uh, basically to have uh, what you call um, a country that is really being blessed by God we must um, how do I say we must basically implement Hudu laws for example right so I think there's going to be a lot of discussions after this about, about this, this particular issue and it's, it's very important for us to know whether could there exist two different sets of laws in this country for example yeah? when it was clear in our constitution that Islamic laws were only for family matters, family and personal matters not in other, uh, other issues or other matters so, and this does not in any way take away the fact that a secular, that, um, a secular progressive system of governance, one that valued fundamental liberties, in particular equality, was the aim of the constitution and also the leaders uh, of the time. Right? So what went wrong? Yeah. How did we get into this situation right now? Right? Oh, no. I, as a social activist, as a human rights activist, I think that so no, we, we are facing now a lot of problems. We are, we are, I mean, we have seen recently uh, this case in Tregano, for example, when one who had undergone a sexual um, um, operation, right, change of sex, right, and he wanted or she wanted to get her name changed on the IC, right, when he went to, to uh, the court and uh, it was being turned down, right. The judge turned it down when he came up with uh, with an evidence from basically a specialist psychiatrist and also a medical specialist, and yet it was turned down, and he died out of depression, and that was to me was very bad, right? So we are trying to basically to prevent a person from having from leading a life that she wants. Right? Because we feel that, you know, they, they shouldn't be. Because we feel that our religion says that there should not be any um, such operation being done. Or a person cannot change his or her sex. Similarly, I think uh, the same thing happened in, was it uh, Nugis Milan? Recently? Yeah. About the uh, issues three. Yeah. So, that's, this is the kind of problems that we are facing. Right? If we don't have, we don't. If we were not very clear about this thing, then these are the difficulties that we are going to face. Yes, of course, it all started perhaps because from the Iranian Revolution itself, right? And people started to become more aware and about morality, for example. So the most important thing nowadays, like for example, uh, government. Well, I, I wouldn't particular name, a particular state or whatsoever. But the, the, the first thing that came to their mind when they're in power is that to regulate how women should wear. You, know? you should wear this, you should wear that, you cover your head, you cannot show your aura or whatever. And that's their uh, prime obsession right? about women. About how women wear and you know about women's rights basically. And we see that the problem is not only with the Islamic party. The problem is also with the ruling party. Right? If we think that the problem lies with the Islamic party, it's okay, fine. They are, they are somewhere in the East Coast. Right? We are in, on, right? So, but, but now the problem is that the problem is with the ruling party itself. They're trying to out-Islamize each other. Right? They're trying to say, uh, we are more Islam than, than the Islamic party, than PAS. So we have to do certain things. So they want to basically, um, as I said here, they want to just, just uh, look at one issue, this Allah issue, right? Who was at the forefront? It was, it was Amno, right? They were so much against, against non-Muslims of 
using the kalimah of Allah. Jais, Jakim, they were very much against it, right? They raided uh, DUMC and, you know, right? And uh, they had done a lot of things, right? Just because they wanted to uh, portray themselves as uh, defenders of Islam. And they organized this, uh, what they call uh, Himpun. How many turn out? But, but yeah, they wanted to show their force yeah, by doing that. So as I say, now for me, I'm concerned about this creeping Islamization into our daily lives. Yeah? And that is uh, the most important thing that we have to be aware of. Right? And um, we, we have seen this all kind of behaviors, you know, like people trying to uh, break up uh, peaceful forums, discussing about human rights, discussing about women's rights, and so on and so forth. This uh, unruly behavior is being tolerated or even promoted by the government. So I would say this, uh, you know, um, how do I say it? A self, uh, I mean, uh, government-sponsored, right? <laughs> government-sponsored activism. Yeah. So, finally, as we know that, you know, we're at the verge. But could it be turned to an Islamic country? Yes. If a two-third majority of the parliament agreed that, you know, the constitution should be changed. All right? But um, uh, but we have to understand that uh, despite all this, you know, we there is the importance because of it that we have to ensure that you know we do not give a two-third majority to any government because of this particular situation, not even to the PR, <laughs> because I don't know what they'll turn into <laughs> if they get two-third majority. <laughs> Right, so conclusion, so you must have uh, an independent, a truly independent judiciary, a government that understands the condition and constitutionalism, and people are willing to stand up for our rights. Right, recently we, we stand up for the rights of uh, the uh, Wilaya uh, Bill, right, and uh, just uh, last night it was being cancelled, right, with rule, yeah, and um, any less to make constitution, all its ideas and hope was little more than the paper it is printed on. So it is us who have to fight for our rights and not to leave just to the politicians to make the um, to decide for us. It is us to decide for ourselves. Right? As Mahatma Gandhi says, you have to be the change you want to see. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farooq. Um, uh, uh, basically, Dr. Farouk's uh, opinion is that our Malaysian federal constitution is actually secular and not Islamic. And the provision that says uh, that Islam is the official religion is merely ceremonial. So that's what I gathered from um, uh, Dr. Farouk's uh, uh, speech. So now we move on to our second speaker. Uh, our se second speaker is uh, Ms. Encik Nizam Bashir. Uh, Nizam is a civil law and a Sharia law practitioner. He also blogs uh, at uh, www. Okay, <laughs> and he's been doing so since uh, 2006. Um, uh, he has written for mainstream newspapers, online media, and has given numerous interviews on BFM uh, and Capital FM on matters pertaining to human rights and Sharia law. Uh, to make up for all that, he does also pro bono cases whenever he can. So welcome Nizam, and let's hear what Nizam has to share, uh, say about this. Uh, lights, lights please. Technical. Anusha. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Madam Moderator, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, friends and enemies. <laughs> I'm glad to be a part of this forum this morning. Um, the question posed for today's forum is uh, quite important as I see it. Um, we, we are presently in a climate whereby religious considerations are overtaking all other considerations on a whole host of subject matters. Yeah? Uh, on the one hand, we have heard of cases of read of cases whereby children have been converted uh, unilaterally by one parent. Um, you have individuals being prevented from professing a religion of their choice. Um, and you have individuals being prevented from manifesting a gender identity of their choice. That's on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, you also have cases whereby uh, students or even civil servants being prevented from wearing a, a religious attire that they want to. So it's a very strange sort of situation. On the one hand, you know, we are told you can't, you can't be irreligious. On the other, we are being told, you know, hang on a second, you can't be too religious either. So it's a very strange uh, times to be living in. Uh, it, it is as if we are uncertain as to what we are allowed as citizens. Yeah. Now, I think the, the most important question to ask at this juncture is this. Where does the fault lie? Because you have this whole um, uh, a number of cases coming out on these issues. And the courts, on the one hand, seem to be a bit uncertain as to which direction they want to go. And I think the problem probably lies in the fact that you have a constitution which unfortunately uh, may not be understood properly by the parties who are responsible uh, in, in, in ensuring that our rights are upheld. Um, and, and I can't say that I blame the relevant parties too much, yeah? simply because there are nuances to the Constitution. And uh, you know, if you were to read it casually, those nuances can be lost upon the casual reader. Um, for example, if you were to look at the nine scheduled uh, list two of the Federal Constitution, it's that part of the Constitution which gives the states the power to legislate on Islamic matters. Yeah? Now, if you were to read that particular portion of the Constitution in isolation, it almost seems to suggest that everything is there in place for Malaysia to be an Islamic state. Almost, and, and, and I say the word almost, yeah, simply because if you read it in isolation, states can do anything they want on matters relating to Islamic law, personal law, family law, yeah? But once you begin to read the provisions of the Constitution, especially the other articles, a different picture begins to unfold, yeah? Um, and I think it is that, that uh, myopia, I think, that the relevant parties have when they're looking at the Constitution, which uh, places us in our present predicament today. Now, let's, let's firstly look at the relevant features which makes the uh, federal constitution um, non-secular in nature. Yeah? We, we have to concede that the federal constitution in Malaysia is not necessarily entirely secular. It has got religious features or Islamic features within it. Now firstly, let's look at 9 Schedule List 2. As I mentioned earlier, 9 Schedule List 2 has a whole host of subject matters which the states can legislate, uh, which, which the states can rely upon in order to come up with, with uh, relevant legislation affecting Islamic law. Yeah? Beyond that, there's also Article 3, Sub 1, which my learned, uh, 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 colleague, Dr. Farouk, touched upon earlier. Article 3, Sub 1 says that Islam is the religion of the Federation. Yeah? Uh, this seems to suggest that the government is uh, entitled not to be neutral uh, in, terms of the uh, in, in terms of religion in Malaysia. Then there's Article 12.2, which talks about um, the right of the fed, uh, Federation and the state to establish or maintain uh, Islamic institutions. This, this uh, uh, a number of the provisions which uh, entitle the state to, to uh, 
to establish or maintain religious institutions. Yeah. Uh, then coming back to nine scheduled list two. Earlier I mentioned that nine scheduled list two entitles the state to legislate on Islamic law, personal law, family law. Beyond that, that very same schedule entitles the state to create Sharia courts and to to also legislate um, the procedure affecting Sharia courts as well as the hiring of Sharia officials. So. Given all these provisions um, within the federal constitution, it is clear that there are features within the constitution which makes it not entirely a secular constitution. But now let's take a step back. So we have all those provisions on the one hand. What about the provisions that makes the constitution a secular constitution? Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, you can't read the constitution in isolation. Uh, one of the most important uh, provisions in the federal constitution, as I see it, is Article 74. Article 74 sub 2 says that states have the power to legislate on matters set out in the 9th schedule, this 2. But 74.3 crucially then goes on to say that that power to legislate is subject to conditions and restrictions in the federal constitution. Yeah. So whatever the power that the state may have in the ninth schedule, it is subject to certain conditions or restrictions. Now here's the question. What are those conditions or restrictions? To my mind, the most important uh, restriction or condition is part two of the federal constitution. And part two of the federal constitution is that part of the constitution which sets out all our fundamental liberties. Now what are, the, what, what are um, an example of the fundamental liberties that we have in the Constitution? There's right to life and personal liberty in Article 5, freedom from, from uh, slavery, protection against retrospective criminal laws, equality, freedom of movement, free speech and expression. So all these things are matters whereby the state cannot legislate upon to take away those rights from us as citizens. So it doesn't matter that you have the power to legislate on Islamic law, but you can't do um, an act, or you can't enact a legislation which uh, uh, steals away those rights as set out in Part 2 of the Federal Constitution. So in other words, Part 2 of the Federal Constitution, at the very least, indicates that our Constitution is actually a secular Constitution. Yeah? Now here's the other thing. Having said that, that uh, you know, Part 2 of the Federal Constitution makes the constitution a secular constitution. Is that a problem for Muslims in general? And, and as I see it, the answer is no. Simply because all those fundamental liberties that is set out in part two of the federal constitution is actually in truth, not inimical to Islam in any way. Yeah? Now, let's, let's, uh, let's consider a number of practical cases, yeah? You have cases whereby individuals wish to apostatize. You have cases whereby child custody, you have one party converting, the other party doesn't convert. Custody is then given to one, one individual. Is that fair? Is that appropriate? You have child conversion cases whereby the father comes to, to, to convert the child without the knowledge of maybe the non-Muslim mother. You have cases whereby there's an uncertainty as to whether a person is Muslim or otherwise, and we don't know where the cops in question is supposed to go. Is it a Muslim burial ground? Is it a non-Muslim burial ground? So it's all these cases highlights the difficulties that may exist if uh, the constitution is non-secular. Uh, if sorry, if the constitution is non-secular in nature, yeah. So um, let's address firstly the question of apostasy. Yeah. If you look at the Quran, Surah Yusuf, verse 99 uh, to 100, freedom of conviction freedom of religious conscience is actually fundamental in Islam. Yeah? So, that is one part. Equality. Surah Ghafir, verse 14. Equality is an important ideal in the Quran. Being, uh, being impartial to a person, uh, irrespective of the person's caste or creed. It's clear from Surah An-Nisa that one is supposed to stand firm for truth in all circumstances. So, in fact, if you were to look at the Quran, all these ideals set out in, in, in part two of the federal constitution is actually there. It's actually there in the Quran. So in fact, if you're a Muslim and you were to study the Quran carefully, 
there is no conflict. There is no conflict, there is no concern that one person should have, merely because the constitution is secular, because of part two of the federal constitution. So the question that we need to ask is, why then, why then there's this hesitance to uphold the secular aspects of the constitution, almost as if it's a problem if you're a Muslim? Um, and I, I'll, I'll be very candid. I'm not entirely sure why there's that hesitance. But if I'm called to speculate, I imagine it's got to do something with power and wealth. Yeah? Because without there being conflict, you can't accrue power or wealth. Um, and and I, I think I, I don't really want to talk too much about this because I think my, the, the London first speaker actually has gone on into all the other articles. But in conclusion, let me just say this. Yeah? Irrespective of whatever that's happening around us today, I still consider Malaysians as being blessed, simply because we have a wonderful constitution. It promises all of us a place under the sun, without fear of being uh, persecuted or being oppressed. And as non-secular as that sounds, I think that is actually quite divine. Thank you. Thank you, Nizam. That's uh, oh, okay. Initially, well, he took just ten minutes, uh, so we have plenty of time. Uh, anyway, I just want to uh, summarize uh, what Nizam is saying. That, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, um, actually Nizam says that uh, at the end of the day, we are secular. Our federal constitution, although uh, that there, there are provisions of the Islamic, uh, so it's kind of hybrid. Can I say that hybrid? Uh, but I would just, um, uh, you know, and Nizam said that uh, even if it is uh, Islamic, uh, uh, there shouldn't be any problem uh, for the Muslims or something. Uh, and also an issue of apostasy uh, and uh, Nizam cited some Quran, uh, you know, uh, provisions. Uh, but you see, if really uh, according to the practice, uh, Islam uh, right now outside there, I won't be able to color my hair, have my hair out, uh, wearing my skirts, and I think, um, uh, I don't think there's one case in Malaysia, a born Muslim, uh, being allowed to get out of Islam yet. Uh, the cases that have been, um, that have been uh, uh, allowed, as far as I'm, I know, that they are all convers converted they get married and they convert. Uh, some of them have been allowed to leave Islam, but no born Muslim have been allowed has been allowed yet. So uh, I'm just uh, making a little comments. <laughs> anyway, for our third speaker now, we have um, Malik Imtia Sarwa. Okay, uh, Malik is a lawyer and an activist. Uh, he is a recognized opinion leader on matters of law and government. Governance. Uh, he has, over the years, established himself a key member of civil society. Uh, Mali Imtiaz, as well, was the president of the Malaysian National Human Rights Society, HAKAM, uh, from 2006 to 2012. <coughs> and through HAKAM, he also played an active role in Article 11, a coalition of NGOs whose main objective has been to promote awareness of the equal protection afforded to all citizens with particular reference uh, to the freedom of religion. He was also the co-founder of Project Malaysia, a non-profit initiative aimed at promoting a non-partisan objective critical discourse on core Malaysian issues. Uh, Imtiaz has been at the forefront of effort to promote the rule of law, civil liberties, and rights discourse in Malaysian society. Uh, he's a regular speaker and presenter at seminars and conferences locally and internationally, and is recognized for his outstanding contribution to Malaysian society. Uh, and uh, in 2009, he was awarded the prestigious Index on Censorship, Freedom of Expression Award by the London-based Index on Censorship. So we welcome Malik Imtia Sarwa to hear what he has to say. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everyone. Um, okay. 
seems that we have this, we have these kinds of forums once every so often over the last what ten years now, and we seem to be saying the same things, um, just adding more and more instances of abuses and things that um, have upset us over the intervening period. Um, but I don't think it's any less important to remind ourselves what's happening. Um, maybe now, with the shifting sands, um, the, the seeming reformation of our political movement, things may take a different turn. Um, I'm looking at the fact that, you know, for once we've seen government back down on a matter pertaining to Islam with the withdrawal of that bill um, that was so controversial over these last few days. Um, but I share the views of my co-speakers. I think this is an extremely important subject that we must uh, acquaint ourselves with, and in particular, we must seek to understand what the different perspectives are uh, of all the different stakeholders. Um, we may know what's right for us, but in order to understand a solution, um, or trying to understand which way we should move, I think we should try and understand what's right for the others as well. And I think this is a two-way uh, discussion. Now, I'd like to start off by um, saying firstly that I think the topic of the forum is confusing. Um, rather than um, be concerned about whether the Constitution as an instrument is secular or not, I think we should be more concerned with the legal system that the Constitution puts in place. Um, because, you know, you can call the Constitution whatever you want. Hybrid, secular, Islamic. It doesn't mean anything. What really matters is at the end of the day how the law translates into action um, within society. So with a small rebuke of that nature, sorry, uh, city, <laughs> I think that's where the, um, the, the, the topic should, or the other, the discussion should focus, all right? Okay, now I see the situation that we're in as the um, result of three intersecting problems. Now, firstly, um, um, a decline in the understanding and appreciation of what the Constitution is and represents and what it intends. And this problem, I think, has come up um, in part because of a quote-unquote a de-education of Malaysians over the last 25 to 30 years. Um, you know, I don't think we have the best people in the positions of influence that they are in. When I say the best, I don't mean to say that they are lacking in integrity, although that's obviously a concern amongst many of us. But I just think sometimes, with the greatest respect to all of concern, I don't think they're clever enough. <laughs> I don't think they're qualified enough. And more fundamentally, I don't think they're competent enough to be in the kind of positions that they are. Which is why we hear the kind of asinine things we hear from time to time, from ministers to um, uh, uh, directors of agencies to all sorts of things, you know. It's an insult to our intelligence, but unfortunately, those people who insult our intelligence on a daily basis are the people who are making the decisions. So that's something to think about. The second problem, I think, which is part of this composite, is, is um, a total lack of regard uh, for the rule of law, which we've seen systematically become more and more uh, entrenched as a trend since uh, Dr. Mahade first came in as Prime Minister. So we've seen systematic disregard of the fundamentals of our system of law and all that it entails. It's not just about legal systems, it's about the kind of checks and balances and uh, power dynamic that the Constitution expects or contemplates. We've seen a total disregard of that over the last um, uh, 25 uh, years or so. Okay, now, what's happened there is, yes, we can say, oh, that's a breach of the rule of law, or that's a breach of the rule of law, and we say it all the time. The Bar Council has been at the forefront of making those kinds of statements, and I think correctly so. But the, but the problem is, with lack of accountability and a lack of um, um, uh, appreciation on the part of the executive as to what it is that's happening, then the, rule, the, the disregard of the rule of law, rather than, becoming that, rather than being the exception, has become the norm. And what we've seen is an entrenchment of that sort of thinking on the part of the organs of state and the people within it. So when someone says someone died in prison or custodial death happened, the Im immediate reaction is to say no, no such thing happened, until you produce a corpse and say, well, that's a dead person, and the last place we saw that person was in your prison cell. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, he happened to die. That well, We had nothing to do with it. 
and so on and so forth. So, you know, we do this song and dance every single time, not just on custodial deaths, we do it on Islamic issues, we do it on a range of things. You talk about the fact that, you know, we're number 200 on the level of, or list of inst education, whatever it is, in the world, they say, well, we're not 201. It's not that big, 200. Rather than saying, yeah, you're right, we have a problem. So, you see, it, in that system, what's happened is, as, as Nizam said, it's become more about power than, than anything else, right? So the, the second issue I'd like to highlight is the total lack of regard for rule of law. Okay, the third problem, the intersecting problem, is endemic corruption, all right? So when you put a stupid administrator in a position of influence where he doesn't have to worry about the fact that the, that the police or the AG is gonna go after him, and then you give him a hell of a lot of money, excuse my language, um, you've got a problem, right? And in that situation, that becomes the focal point of governance. Not due governance, not you and me, not ensuring orderly uh, organization of society, it becomes about that. Now, it's in this context that we must look at the issues pertaining to Islamic administration. We're not talking about Islam, the religion. We're talking about the administration of Islam. And, you know, just to make the point clear, just because they have the word Islamic before administrator doesn't make them less human. All right? There's this conception that because that person is well-placed or is a member of the Islamic administration, he or she is sacrosanct. And we can't say anything about that person. Because to do so would be insulting Islam. All right? So that's ridiculous as far as I'm concerned because you find that just as there are other pedophiles, you also have pedophiles within the, uh, in the Islamic system as well. All right? That's heinous across the board. We've seen Ustazes get charged for sodomy and statutory rape as well. And we've heard the Court of Appeal express its complete shock and horror and manifest that horror in terms of the sentence meted out to that person. So just because you're an Islamic administrator doesn't make you less human than the next person. All right, but then we have the offense of insulting a mufti in some of the um, enactments at the state level. Yeah, I'm right, isn't it? So I'm just saying, well, if I think a mufti is stupid, why can't I say it? <laughs> All right? But apparently in some states, by saying that, I'm committing an offense. And that goes back to the point that Dr. Farouk so articulately made about the, the so-called monolithic Islam that Muslims in this country are supposed to accept that, that is defined for us at state level, you know, rather than from the individual perspective based on the freedom of religion. All right, so all of this, and primarily the, the need for unregulated access to money and power and influence have led to the establishment of a climate of fear. So we see all these offenses that are created around us that say, no, you can't question this, you can't talk about that, you can't say that if you do, it's seditious, or if you do, it's a breach of Islamic uh, laws, and you go to jail for this. Ezra Zaid is now facing a charge in, in, in court for the fact that he was a director of a company that published a book by Ishad Manji. Okay? We're representing him on that. We're in the federal court trying to understand whether the state legislative assembly can actually restrict freedom of expression, because that's something that only parliament can do as far as we're concerned uh, under the constitution, subject of course to the propagation article you saw just now, article 4 sub 4. All right, so it's interesting. Okay, so we have this climate of fear. Now in the climate of fear, those administrators who might actually want to do something that's good for the rest of us, suddenly develop what I call tall poppy syndrome. Tall poppy syndrome is very simply defined as not wanting to stick your head up too high. Because if it's too high, you can be spotted and your head is chopped off. All right? So we have that problem now. So when you go to courts, for example, and you argue basic things like we've seen on the board just now, you know, articulate principles of democracy or due governance or freedoms and so on and so forth, that in any other country in the world, I mean, civilized country that we claim to be, in any such country in the world, if you say something like that in court, the judges would nod with you and say, yes, of course, thank you for reminding us of a hallowed truth. But when you say it in the courts of our country, you get these shocks, the shock looks or these looks of, um, of um, uh, dismissiveness or sometimes you get this, oh, why are you saying this sort of thing in my courtroom, you know? Don't make this a political forum. So, tall poppy syndrome has in a way paralyzed 
our administrators made them incapable of dealing with the real problems that have resulted in the kind of situation we have in this country. All right, that's one. Now, in that context, so you now have the rampant corruption, the abuse, the, the twisting and turning of, of law to suit that collateral purpose, i.e. enrichment, gain, power, and then you have tall poppy syndrome, and then in the middle of all of that, you have us. Okay, fearful, terrified, don't know what to do, come to forums like this, listen to some people like us, cheer a bit, go home hefty, and then start worrying all over again to the next forum. All right, but then you also have some quarters who have begun to be completely and thoroughly confused about who they are and what they are. All right, now I say this respectfully of my Malay uh, friends, all right, and, and please accept this in the, in the, in the right spirit. I mean, if I was a Malay and I was told for the last 25 years that I'm not fit to compete with anybody else in this country, that I need to be helped along, I need to be given education of a substandard nature so that I can at least get A's and get into a university, get a degree and come out to be given a subsidized life, I'd have a major problem with my identity as well. I would want to know what that is. You know, I'd be having a massive identity crisis. All right? So in that scenario where we have, in a way, systematically taken away the essential elements of the Malay identity from our Malay brothers and sisters, and then we fed them a steady diet of racial and religious supremacy, obviously we've created a situation where some of them are inclined to think that this is the only way to go. And they develop a religious identity, which is not a true religious identity, but rather one which they wear as a guise as a way to project themselves forward. These are the kinds of people I say, again generally, that sort of used to come around here every so often when we had forums like this and shout and scream a bit out there. People who need to wear their religion on their sleeve in a way that doesn't reflect the true, true uh, essence of it. So when my co-speaker Nizam asked the question of, he's not, or suggested that he was not entirely sure about what it is that's driving this particular quarter or a group of people. Yes, there are them, some who actually think that it's about maybe self-gain, but there are many who are fearful. And because they are left in a void, not, uh, not fully aware of how it is that they can develop their own identity, they start reaching. And they become fundamentalists in the, in the negative sense of that word. All right, And we've seen that sort of trend happen in other countries as well. And what's interesting is this. A while ago, I was asked to chair a forum um, in uh, Prague um, to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Declaration of Intolerance. I got an email, I got an invitation to Prague, I said, why not, let's go. Um, and uh, little did I know that I was going to be chairing a particularly contentious uh, workshop. <laughs> uh, because they asked me to speak about the freedom of expression and the freedom of religion, the, the way it co combines. All right, so I thought, oh, okay, looking at the kind of work I've been doing, uh, freedom of religion has, in a way, a freedom of expression issue. Because I can profess, but I can't practice. That's the problem Nina Joy faced. She was a Christian. What she was stopped from doing was expressing her choice of religion because of state identification of is issues. Not about, no one could tell her, don't be a Christian. You get me? So, profess is in here, practice is expressing. So I thought, oh, okay, love, very good, I'll speak about that. I'll come across something a bit intelligent in Prague, I'll walk around a bit and come home. When I got there, my co-chair was someone from Amnesty International, and she goes, I hope you're ready for this. I said, what? How? What's, what's going to be difficult about this? And she said, well, you know, we've got this prophet cartoon issue blowing up in our face right now, and that's going to be what the focal point of expression is. So free of expression of the part of others, as opposed to free of religion of others. That clash. I said, are you? So needless to say, we had a very lively session because there were about 60 people, most of them diplomats, 30 from the OIC countries and about 20 from the Scandinavian, the other side of the, of the debate. And it got really, really heated, very heated, you know, with shouts and screams and accusations of fundamentalism and censorship and, you know, all of that. Somehow we managed to get it under control, and I said, well, look, before we go to that, let's take that one proposition that Islam uh, breeds extremism. Um, and analyze it. And I said, I challenge uh, the group, uh, and I, my conclusion is it's not the religion. 
because you can say that of any religion if you wanted to historically. So when I said my suggestion rather was that it's social justice or injustice that leads to extremism. Now, I've told you this story to set the context for this. If you look around you, which countries are the ones usually burning effigies and so on and so forth? <laughs> you know, Pakistan, Saudi, other such countries where, what do they have? Rampant corruption, massively de-educated uh, individuals, high degree of poverty, low levels of literacy. All right, that's effigy burning country. And the, and the same could be said of other places where you have similarly um, emotive uniting factors that lead to people reacting. So you see, what's interesting is in Pakistan, they'd be reacting against something that was happening in the US, rather than complaining about the fact that their prime minister or this particular leader was looting the country and keeping everybody stupid and poor. All right? So I ask you now, at which point in this country did we start burning effigies? Not too long ago. So what did the parallels tell us? That our problem, I think, is not so much about religion as it is about social injustice and the fact that social injustices are perpetrated on a daily basis under the name of Islam. And that's the difficult part. And both co-speakers have already spoken about how it is that the shifting landscape had led to a point where some, uh, I would say about 15 to, 15 to 20 years ago, Islam became political currency. You see, you see the statement made by Mahade, quite clever. Because when you say it in, in Malay, Nagara Islam, it doesn't, it doesn't mean as much as saying Islamic State. But that, that ambiguity was something that he capitalized on. Now, what about to tell you that in 2001, we had the first decision of the Supreme Court to say that um, in order for a Muslim to exit the religion, he needed to get an uh, exit order from a Sharia court. All right? Do the dates tell you anything? 2001, this says Islamic country. Nagara Islam, Islamic State. 2001, Supreme Court says, no, go to the Sharia court. All right? And I'll tell you what happened there. As far as I understand it, I may be wrong, but this is my understanding of it. Um, from about the mid-80s, when the whole Islamic uh, race started between Amno and Pas, Islam became, a, as, my, as Dr. Farouk has already said, Islam became a big thing. All right? Now, that happens within the same time frame as the dismantling of democracy. Okay, so 87, we had Opera Silalang, Climate of Fear starts. 88, we had the sacking of, of the Chief Justice, two Supreme Court Justices, and a wholesale undermining of the Constitution by several amendments, including the insertion of Article 1211, capital A, which I think is not a problem at all. I think it's fine, but it's become a very contentious provision because surely what is within the jurisdiction of the Sharia Court should not be visited upon by the High Court. I agree with that. But if the Sharia court access, exceeds jurisdiction, and this is what we argued in Lina Joy, we said, look, if the Sharia court sentenced someone to death, it cannot do that. And the Sharia appeals court affirmed that sentence, it cannot do that as well. Does that mean we let that person die? Or will the High Court intervene under the Judicature Act to say that this order is ultra-virus the Sharia court? It's as simple as that. Administrative lawyers know this. But it's become this hugely sensitive thing that there is this brick wall between the Sharia courts and the High Court and it cannot be pierced, etc., etc., etc. That's so wrong. So the Chief Justice then, Ahmad Fairuz, accepted that. So of course that can't happen. So you see, there is this wider room for discussion. So 1211A is not the real problem. The problem started with him, with, sorry, with the Constitution being amended to remove the judicial power to review. Or so the courts thought. Because I think it's I think it's ridiculous. What the amendment means is what the courts say it means. But the courts are happy to say what it it meant what the executive said it meant, which is you take away the inherent right of judicial review. Okay, so what that means is Parliament became the master of the judiciary, and the judicial power was vested by federal law. What federal law gives, it can take away. And we certainly had the wholesale introduction of all these legislative provisions that say that you cannot review this, you cannot review this, no judicial review on this. We saw it in the ISA, we saw a bit of it in the OSA, we saw some parts of it in the PPPA, Printing Presses Act, and so on and so forth. This was Mahade's master scheme. Control the right to review. All right? So in that context, after sacking a few chief justice, uh, the chief justice and two, chiefs, uh, two Supreme Court justices, the other judges got terrified. And as the old guard began to uh, phase out, 
by the mid 90s we had the Shankers and the VC Georges and, and all those judges who were, you know, outstanding legal minds retire. The new bunch came in and newer judges came in. And I don't have to say much, the VK Lingam Commission says it all. Made made the decision of who would become judges at parties according to his evidence, based on what people were whispering to him and so on and so forth. So much so that it got to a point where Badawi had, to, the late, next Prime Minister, Ahmad Badawi, had to say that, yeah, we don't have the best people on the bench. Now, isn't that scary? It is. And these are the people who are now deciding how all of this works. And I don't know whether these people actually read the kind of books that Dr. Farooq reads or Inchit Nizam reads. I don't think they read, <laughs> you know, sometimes. So what do you do in that situation? It's very, very, very worrying. Now, so, you know, we can sit here and discuss these issues and all of us are nodding at the same things, no matter what our, pref our, our views are, because these are fundamental truths, right? But these tall poppy people cannot. They can't agree with that because that would mean they're affecting status quo and there are problems that come with that. You, you get me? So in 2001, the first time Supreme Court said this because by that time, the judiciary was terrified of its own shadow, I think. And they were worried that there would be repercussions coming down. All right? I'm happy to say that I think the current Chief Justice is doing his own thing to try and get things moving again, judging by what he's been saying publicly, and I've written about this in, in my, my columns as well. I think, I think he's on the right path. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I think we're at least seeing some steps uh, forward, you know, addressing corruption in the judiciary, uh, addressing uh, influences, and so on and so forth. Okay. All right. So it's in that context that I think we've got to the situation where the situation is very muddied. Now, it is not muddied because of the Constitution. It is muddy because you have people articulating the kind of positions that they do in and outside court, and the judges are unfortunately not in a position to be as strong as I think they should, either because they don't appreciate it or they do and they're not sure how it all works. Now, this is not something that's confined to Islamic issues as well, all right? And it's not something, in all fairness to, um, to our courts, that's confined to this country alone, all right? Uh, some of you may have read that two days ago we were in the federal court arguing for uh, access to certain documents on the Shabbos. So I represent Charles Santiago and a few other people and we've gone all the way up to the federal court and we've argued locus standi of um, uh, individuals like us who want access to information. So it's become a, a freedom of information case. And I can see that the bench is struggling with how far that right should be permitted, if at all. Because on the one hand, you have this belief that all information should be secret, except where law allows for disclosure. And England used to be like that until they had the Freedom of Information Act. And on the other side, you have the more, more um, robust Indian position, which is all information should be public unless and until it's been restricted by law. And can Canada is somewhere in between. Australia is not sure where it is. The US goes between both sometimes. Um, so, you know, it's not an easy subject. And, and watching the judges the other day in court, I realized that, you know, precedent setting is a very, very frightening thing. Because when you make a decision now, it's going to have an impact um, 20, 25, 30 years down the road. What I wonder is why it is that they didn't seem to have any problems with the pro-conservative uh, pro sort of uh, decisions that have been made over the last few years that have created so much difficulty in this, this sort of thing. They weren't afraid about setting precedents there. And that says, I think, a lot. Okay, so we come down to issues like this freedom of, uh, sorry, this, this um, unilateral conversion provision, okay, in Wilaya recently. Now, I'm glad it became controversial, but in truth, I can't understand why it did because other state laws already have that provision, one or the other, Ibu, Atta, or Papa. In fact, that was one of the provisions that was looked at, the Slango Act, Slango Enactment, was looked at in Subashini, which we argued. And um, surprisingly, uh, Justice Aziz, who was a very, very competent, qualified, well-liked judge, made the de determination, although I think it's obiter, meaning it's not part of the decision, um, that the constitutional gender uh, uh, guarantee did not apply to this father or mother determining choice of faith, which I thought was quite surprising. 
um, but he did, he did it. So in, in truth, what they've tried to do in, in Wilaya recently is actually make it consistent with what um, Subashini, the federal court, said there, as well as other states. Now, I don't agree with it, and I think that's why Mr. Karpal Singh is asking for clarification by way of constitutional amendment. I don't think we need that as well. I think we just need strong, decisive leadership. And that's my last point. Uh, Dr. Farouk talked, said that he ended his presentation by saying, look, we can still go forward in the right way. I think we can. Because really, if you, in, the, in terms of the longer history of this country, both pre- and post malika we've done fairly well. Huh? We've not killed ourselves yet. We've managed to live together, and there's no issues, really. We know how to do it. It's what upstairs forces on us that, that makes it a bit difficult for us. Okay? So what that means is, if we have clear directions set for us by leadership in, on these critical things, on how we intersect together as a society, on how the dichotomy between personal law and secular law, public law, I mean, uh, applies in our, in our country, I think we'd be, we'd be fine. And it starts with an understanding of constitutionalism and all that it entails. See, Ram Das Tikam Das Nizam was just saying should be given an award for having argued Che Omar Cho Che So, which we all thought was quite funny. Because you know, you have this Hindu lawyer going to court and saying that his Muslim client should be exempted from the uh, death penalty. Brilliant. Um, and in doing so, he clarified what what would he in, in future become a very contentious issue. And Che Omar Che So has never been overruled. Many invitations have been made to the court to, tr to depart from Che Omar Che So. Lina Joy, the argument was made that maybe it's time for the court to revisit Article 3, ignore Article 4.1 about the supremacy of the law, but the court declined. And I, I'm glad it did. So, the blueprint is very clear. It's the politics that made us go wrong. And if we can just go back to how things were in the 80s, before Mahathir started his um, rise to uh, I don't know what. I can't think of a nice way of saying it, so I won't say it. Um, uh, I think we're, we're all right. you know. Um, and I agree with Dr. Farooq that strengthening the institutions, uh, addressing social injustice is the, is the way to go. If we start educating Malaysians again, getting them to understand what the real issues are, I think we're going to be well down that road towards recovery. But we've, we've got to start doing that. And uh, I think that's how it should be looked at. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Oops. <laughs> thank you, Malik. Uh, what a very informative uh, talk. Um, much appreciated. But I must respond to the title. Um, actually, uh, you, as everybody understand that, actually we wanted to do a more specific title, um, but. If we actually do that specific title, this the bar will be uh, full with um, people demonstrating downstairs. Uh, we will not be able to actually even have this forum. Uh, there will be lots of problems. So we are very careful uh, in choosing our forum title so that we are not going to be stopped uh, by any uh, uh, you know parties that disagree. Uh, you know that things that might happen inside here. So that's the reason why the title is very wide. Uh, how secular is our constitution? So we can discuss everything under the constitution under that subject. So basically, what uh, Malik uh, is saying is that um, if uh, there's so many things that actually Malik say, but I just uh, say uh, what it is not Islam, uh, but the followers that actually uh, you know making all these problems right now, right? Uh, politics. politics, yeah, that's part of it as well. And uh, some problem with the quality of our judges, um, some good, some not so good. And uh, most importantly, we need strong, decisive lead leadership. So I will not say too much anymore because uh, we will actually, uh, because we have plenty of time, uh, uh, I would say that we take a little break now uh, and then uh, we continue uh, with uh, Q&A after that. 
Uh, is that agreeable? I know it's not in the program, but uh, I think we have, uh, you know, some uh, cigarette break, you know, uh, <laughs> toilet break, whatever. So it's not for my benefit, of course. Uh, so we, <laughs> uh, we, I think we take a 10 minute break, or rather we have 11.30, 15 minutes, because uh, we have plenty of time. So 11.30, back in this room and prepare with all your hard questions for the speakers to answer. Uh, put them in the spotlight, okay? Right, 15 minutes, 11.30, we'll be back. Thank you. Now, um, if we can get, yes. Right, um, so I hope you're already with the hot and uh, hot heating questions uh, for the panel. And um, please state your name and your question clearly. Uh, if you want to make a statement, uh, not too long, please, so that we give other people uh, chances to ask questions. Okay, thank you. Siti, can I just ask a question now? Yeah, okay. Uh, good morning and thank you to the speakers uh, for really um, uh, well-articulated uh, insights and arguments. Um, I think my, uh, my name is Angela Kugadas. Um, yeah, my, my question is possibly to uh, Nizam and Malik. Uh, the, you know, Malik, you talked about the administration of law, and I was wondering whether um, you could touch on the role of the AG's office, because uh, from past experience in terms of uh, engaging in litigation advocacy uh, with the help of, you know, very friend friendly lawyers, uh, uh, you know, the AG's office doesn't really seem to act on behalf of uh, the interests of the public. Uh, that's one. And the second question is the implications of this uh, withdrawal of the bill. Uh, is it really a win per se, or is it just a, you know, because uh, with the way the judges have been making their rulings with the way the judges have sort of shied away from making the tough decisions. Uh, how, you know, is it really a win? Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think. Okay, um, the Attorney General is vested with the power to represent government in proceedings uh, brought against the government or against government agencies. So obviously what he says or his officers say in court carries weight because it's reflective of um, policy on the part of government um, on, on issues like this. Now, um, regretfully, my experience with the Attorney General as well as his officers is they tend to take um, positions that are highly conservative and seemingly uh, veered towards protective, protecting the kinds of practices that we are saying are wrong without really um, uh, much justification for it. Uh, for example, on uh, Thursday, um, we had um, a, uh, an argument advanced on, in, on behalf of the government in favour of, of secrecy but without really any uh, justification for why, as a policy, that's a, a, good, a good position to take. Now, in these Islamic cases, um, I've often wondered why it is that we can't work together in trying to formulate the best way forward. Um, instead, what happens is we get arguments advanced that really, in a way, are aimed more at winning than they are about achieving a, a just result. Uh, in Lina Joy, in Subashini, uh, in Shamala, uh, in um, uh, all these cases, we've, we've constantly gone up against an AG's chambers that seems more concerned about protecting or be seen to be protecting the Islamic position as it perceives it than actually trying to understand uh, just solutions. So, 
I'll give you an example. You know these cases involving uh, what we say uh, colloquially the, the body snatching cases. All right, so someone dies. And then there's this tussle over whether that person died a Muslim or, or non-Muslim. Now this isn't a new thing for us. It's been happening for many years. But it only became a problem around the time when um, I'm so, what's that? Morty, when Morty passed away, this was the, the Everest climber, okay? How it used to be dealt with was very simple. If there was a question as to that person's religious status, it was decided as a question of fact by the High Court. Simple as that. Everyone would come with their evidence, the judge would then decide as a question of fact whether this person died a Muslim or non-Muslim after having heard everyone, okay? Now, along the way, someone suggested that maybe what we could do is um, uh, take opinion from the religious authorities as to the guidance on religious positions as to whether or not that person died a Muslim. Okay, but that didn't take away from the fact that it was still dealt with by the High Court. Suddenly, we are being told, mid-2000, 2005, uh, we are being told that no, this is a matter that must be dealt with only by the Sharia Court. And that position ignores the fact that non-Muslims are not within the jurisdiction of the Sharia court. So the response is, never mind, why don't you just go and give evidence anyway? But if a court has no jurisdiction over you, it can't con cite you for contempt, it can't ensure that what you're saying is the truth, etc, etc, etc. So you would think that something like that is so obvious that the Attorney General would immediately say, yeah, that's wrong. It should go to the High Court. But unfortunately, the AGC says, no, that's how it should be, without really any logical basis for it. The other, way, the other issue in the same, same type of case is, um, in those sorts of situations, you have the um, Islamic State Department, or the, uh, Jabat, the Jabatan, that's right, rushing off to the Sharia court and getting declarations on an ex parte basis that so-and-so died a Muslim. And then waving that declaration and saying, well, you can't touch this. You know, now it's, now it's this person is officially a Muslim. All right. The more fundamental question to that is this. Um, the Sharia courts have jurisdiction only over persons professing the religion of Islam. Okay? The Jabatan Agama or Majlis Agama is what we call a body corporate. For legal purposes, it is considered a legal person. It has the status of a person. That's why a company or a body corporate can sue or be sued in its own name. All right? But by no stretch of the imagination can such a body corporate be considered to be a person professing the religion of Islam. All right? So it's, it's so obvious that those ex parte declarations that these majlis get are unconstitutional and completely illegal. But you find the Attorney Generals defending that sort of practice. So I've gone to the Court of Appeal in a company's matter where someone was asserting that a company was a person professing the religion of Islam because he wanted the fight to be in the Sharia court about inheritance as opposed to the civil courts, which he knew would not be partial to his client's case. So when I got to the Court of Appeal, I said, look, I have only one question to ask of my learned friend. Perhaps he can explain to you, in a way that I cannot, how it is that this body corporate can profess a religion, let alone the religion of Islam. So then I sat back and I watched the fun. Because this lawyer struggled with, well, all the directors are Muslims. <laughs> then all the shareholders are Muslims. So therefore, it must be a Muslim com a company. I mean, it just becomes farcical. All right? So the reason I've shared this with you is to just say that when you have the so-called defender or guardian of the constitution, as he's described in other jurisdictions, taking positions which are ridiculous on the face of the law, then you have to wonder whether, one, he is that incompetent, or two, and I don't think he is, and or two, that there must be some other thing happening here. And that's what I meant by uh, the creeping influence of executive decree. I was just discussing this in the break. Unfortunately, our civil servants and also public servants have, over the last 25 plus years, fallen into this mindset where they accept 
policy statements or statements of a general nature by ministers and so on and so forth as being decrees. So we have rule by decree. Minister says this, therefore we must follow it. The law doesn't say it doesn't matter because the minister has, has said it. All right. So can the AGC do a lot more to bring some balance to this? Of course it can. But unfortunately, we're not seeing it happen. And that may be because the Attorney General holds office at His Majesty's pleasure. He's a civil servant, meaning that his contract can be terminated tomorrow, which I think creates a conflict of interest. And one of the things we should be talking about is whether the Attorney General should be given security of tenure like judges, like the Auditor General, like it was supposed to be at the beginning, but for some reason never materialized. All right? Sorry, the second point? The, the, ah, the withdrawal of the bill. I personally, Nizam may have a different view. I think it's a moral victory and one that should be um, exploited and used op op and optimized. Okay, because I think the, 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 the climate is right for, a, for push to happen on this front. But from a legal standpoint, there are different state enactments on Islam. Each state has its own. And some of those state enactments use Ibu Atau Bapa. So that's still there on the books. And then we have the federal court decision in Subashini, where the federal court has said through one judge, although I think it's Obito, I said that earlier, um, <clears throat> that it's Ibu Atau Bapa. So either parent. But that may require either a restatement by the, by the uh, federal court um, or uh, a wholesale change to the scheme, meaning that it starts with an amendment to the Constitution of the 12th Fall. I think it's easier to get a correction done at the federal court personally, but I don't think you should stop pushing. Um, so moral victory, political victory, definite. Legal victory, I'm not sure. I don't think it's, it's got, got much um, traction there. Unless you have... Um, can I just say that I think Article 12 Fall is actually fine the way it is. Even though it, it says parent, singular, is entitled to convert the child. But I think 12.4 has to be read with 11 schedule. 11 schedule says singular includes the plural. So 12.4 was actually meant to cater to single parents having a child. But in the instances whereby there are two parents with a child, the consent of both parents is required. So vis-a-vis -vis those state enactments which suggest that it is sufficient for one parent to convert a child, Simpliciter, i.e., without regard for, for, for the facts of the matter, I think those legislations are actually contrary to the constitution, and I think it's right for for, for a proper case to be brought to the to, to the courts to argue 12.4 and 11 schedule. There's also another point because the Guardianship of Infants Act says both parents have equal say over guardianship issues. So then the question becomes whether mis Muslim children are exempted from the Guardianship of Infants Act, are they? Yes. They are. So then there's a question of why it is that's happening. I don't quite understand that because all children are wards of the court and you have the Child Act which governs everyone. And then, then that takes you into a whole different argument about, for example, this, sorry I'm going to digress a bit, but this issue about child marriages. I think it's completely repugnant to any notion of, uh, of um, you know, a civilized society that we're allowing 12, 13 year old girls to marry uh, um, because what? As one Kadi puts it, we want to avoid them from doing things they shouldn't be doing, so they may as well get married. And I'm thinking the parent of that child should be put into jail for child abuse. Because we say statutory rape laws are there to protect children under 16 because they're not mentally equipped to handle that sort of experience. Now we're saying, except if they're Muslim. You know, I'm, so where's the Attorney General in all of this? He only started to react after there was a lot of noise being made. Because before that, I wrote something and I got called heathen, I got called kafir, the usual things, uh, for suggesting that this was wrong. It doesn't matter whether the child is Muslim or non-Muslim, the child needs protection of the state. And the state is obliged under the Convention of the Rights of the Child, which we are a signatory to, to protect that child to the fullest. And yet we allow this to happen in the name of what? Personal law? It's, it's completely nonsensical. And I wonder where the Attorney General is in all of this. He's remarkable for being silent on some of the most important issues that have taken place in the country over the last five years. Any more questions? Yes.
servant and I don't believe that minister statements are decrees um, but then again probably because I also um, I, I believe that our education system has not failed us as yet okay um, so I have two questions one um, how far is it that the civil court has more power than the Sharia court how far does it go um, and two um, I'd just like to have your comments though the, the panel comments um, on the fact that uh, why some people actually convert into Islam uh, and it, do, do, you know, do they want to have Bumiputra rights maybe when they convert, things like that, you know, is it, is it all just because of power and so does it make sense to then take away those rights and have an equal Malaysia? Just comments on the second question. Thank you. The, the second question first. Uh, I think uh, I think Niza mentioned about it uh, earlier on. Uh, he said that Surah Yunus, right? Well, I would like to cite the most uh, often quoted verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, the second chapter in the Quran, uh, verse 2 by 6, which says that, like Rah Vidin, means that there shall be no coercion in matters of faith. Meaning to say that, uh, you know, whatever you do to convert, the, the ultimate purpose is basically because you have faith and you believe in God, in, in the religion that you want to convert to. Not because of uh, status, not because of this new Buddha status or whatever <coughs> other means. Then, you know, your conversion, I don't think that is a real conversion uh, because, it's be because faith is between you and God. It's not between you and state, or because, not because, between you and society, or government, for example. So it is between you and God. Similarly, as I have said to, uh, I mean, we discussed, uh, I discussed with Nizam uh, um, on many occasions, that, you know, the issue about, for example, like uh, cases uh, of uh, people who have uh, converted, decided to uh, leave Islam, and they were prevented because the law says that you can convert to become a Muslim, but you cannot convert out. You cannot uh, revert back to your to your religion. So you know, to me, to me, uh, as an Islamic activist and as a person who who hold uh, basically I hold fast to this principle, this principle of freedom of religion is that. The concept of la ikrah within, there shall be no coercion of faith, rings hollow if you can only convert to Islam and you are unable to leave Islam. So it is a, it should be a two way, okay? Understand? So, you know, like, uh, I think uh, Malik was with me uh, at that church uh, when we had a discussion about Islamic State and Nur Iza made this statement about about La Ikra Fidin and it was like <laughs> it was all over the newspaper the day after. Right? So but you know I'm trying to reassert the same thing. That it doesn't make sense. Right? So it, it should be both ways, right? Even like um, um, I think uh, Nizam said that uh, born Muslims we are not allowed to leave Islam, right? But somehow or rather in our constitution you know, the Constitution is stated that a Malay is defined to be someone who professes the faith of Islam. You know, like, so it has a lot of implications. <laughs> Does it mean that if you renounce Islam, then you are no more Malay? So, you know, like, it's very confusing. Very confusing, say. I, I think Malik can probably uh, <laughs> shed some light on this issue. And I think uh, I'll stop there and uh, probably uh, I'll comment later on. Well, uh, let me just deal with the second question. 
um, vis a vis the question of conversion, whether it is for status or otherwise. I think a person converts for many reasons. But the question is whether, and, and I suppose the, conver the conversion in Malaysia in particular is necessary because there's no other way to do it. Uh, I suppose you have couples uh, from, from uh, different denominations falling in love with one another, but unfortunately not having the choice but for one party to convert if they want to remain together. Uh, and, and that's unfortunately the, the, the present uh, legislation which prohibits couples from you know, just being with one another in, in whatever faith that they have. Um, if you look at the relevant state enactments on, on this matter, there is, of course, this so-called permission. So, someone who's, you know, uh, uh, who's a people of the book. You can marry a Muslim. But the way people of the book is defined in the legislation in question is so restrictive, I think it's next to impossible. It's next to impossible for any Christian, for example, to be able to marry a Malay. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, to be able to marry a Muslim. Um, given the way they have defined uh, that, that person uh, as having to, to come from a particular tribe uh, of, of Christian uh, uh, community. Uh, so when you have legislation like that in place, the easiest, I suppose, uh, uh, method for someone to come together to, to be in marriage with, with uh, a loved one is probably to just convert in name. Yeah, so maybe status is not so much the the really the idea behind this conversion to name, but you have no other choice because that's a statutory regime that's in place. Yeah, and I, I find it quite surprising that no one has actually attempted to try and challenge the particular provision in question, because when you say right to life, yeah, it includes the ability to be with someone that you love, as I see it. Of course, there's 8.5, which says that it doesn't apply vis-a-vis -vis personal law, but I think the phrase personal law in 8.5 is something that is worthwhile exploring to see whether it's limited uh, and, 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 and uh, does not encompass things like marriage. Uh, sorry, I prefer to stand when I can <laughs> speak. Um, okay. You know, um, before the 2008 elections, a uh, group of us managed to get to meet the then Prime Minister um, to discuss what we thought were important societal issues, or issues that were happening, including the, the fact that some a girl, you know, we've been told that you know, if you need to convert out, you should go to the Sharia court and make your petition there. And it's a process. So we're not restricting you. In fact, the Court of Appeal in Lina Joy said, uh, no, not Lina Joy, but uh, Kamaria Ali said that uh, Muslims have freedom of religion in this country. So let's get that straight. Uh, the, court of, the Court of Appeal has recognized that Muslims have freedom of religion. But that freedom must be exercised through the process which involves the Sharia court. Okay, Kamaria Ali is very clear, it's never been overruled. And that's why I find it shocking that people want to throw things at us when we say that. You know, that, you know, hang on a minute, the courts have recognized it. Okay. What happens then is we get to the Sharia court, all sorts of reasons come up why you aren't going to be given that order. And in private, one Kadi said to me a while ago that, you know, it wasn't our problem before. Why did they make it our problem? Because as a Muslim, I can't be doing this yeah. in a Sharia court because my mandate is defined by Sharia. Then I said, well, actually your mandate is defined by the constitution. But, okay, that's a different topic. Well, because there's another Kadi who said in Kota Kinabalu that the constitution doesn't apply in his Sharia court. <laughs> okay. Um, but he, he, the, the Kadi had a point. He said, why was this placed on me? Okay, then if you track it back, it became a problem for that Kadi and other Kadis because in 2001, the Supreme Court didn't want to handle it. In this case called Sun Singh. And Sun Singh was funny because at first instance, the judge was, a, was the late one Adnan, who later became Chief Judge Malaya. And he was confronted with this very standard application for a declaration that this person was no longer a profession, pro person professing the religion of Islam. But this was late 99, um, at a point where Abim and Anwar Ibrahim and various other forces were already pushing very hard on the ground. Coincidentally, in 95, Chief Justice Fairuz made a declaration in the High Court where he says so and so was no longer a Muslim. 
and there was no need for any further orders to that effect. And this same person later, as Chief Justice, handed down the majority judgment in Lena Joy saying, you need to go to the Sharia court, contradicting what he said earlier. Okay, but the point is, in, t in first instance, one other man sitting in chambers, lawyer goes in and says, you know, my client wants to get out of this. My client is actually Punjabi Sikh, fell in love with some person, converted, then that person ran away. Now he want, he's gone back, he's going to the temple, all of that, no issue. Can we just have the order? One other didn't know what to do. I mean, this is anecdotal, I'm told this by a lawyer who appeared for Sun Singh. And in, a, in, a, in an effort to try and convince or persuade the judge, he says, look, Sun Singh is sitting right outside, wouldn't I bring him in here? No, 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 please don't. And then he dismissed it. So it went up to the court of federal court then. And the federal court was asked to look at Article 11, the Freedom of Religion Guarantee. But they said, in a, in a tremendous departure from established practice, because you didn't raise the constitutional issue in the first instance, we can't take it up here. Which is completely contrary to what we're taught. You are told that you can raise a constitutional issue anywhere, at any stage, because it goes right to the root of everything. So we were told, he was told no, and they kicked out the case. And Justice Zaidin, speaking for the court, said, because the Sharia court regulates conversions in, by implication, it must regulate the conversions out. But that was a fallacy because the Sharia courts do not regulate conversion in. There's no regulation. So that's where all the problems started in 2001. After that, we tried in several cases, starting with Kamaria Ali, to tell the court that Sun Singh was wrong. And in all those cases, the court acknowledged it, but when the judgment was handed down, they just reaffirmed Sun Singh. Until uh, a case called Subashini, where the court finally said Sun Singh is bad law, because it was based on a fallacy, a misappreciation of the law. Okay? That was a bit of a digression. So in, when we told Badawi, look, this problem is limited, and you can break it into three categories. One category are Muslims who want to leave the religion for their own reasons, and that is a minute category. And my conversations with some of these people suggest to me that the reason they want to leave is more because they are rejecting state-defined Islam than Islam itself. So they don't want to be within the ambit of... And you have different permutations of this. Like, for example, some parents, in one case went to Justice B.T. Singham in the High Court, one parent says he doesn't want his child, they're Muslims, but he doesn't want his child to be educated by the Ustas in school because he doesn't want state religion being used to... to, to you know. So it's an education right, a right to religious instruction. But when the SPM results slip came out, it said F on the certificate because although the girl had been exempted from SPM by the ministry, they gave her an F which then affected her, G, her, her aggregate and then affected her chances to go forward. So went to court, lost. But that's one example of a, of a Muslim who doesn't want to be defined by state and would rather not be classified as a Muslim than be classified as a Muslim because otherwise subjected to all sorts of regulations. It's not that they don't believe. They believe, but in a different way. All right. But those who actually want to leave it for another faith altogether, from what I understand, are very small. The number is very, very small. All right. Then the second category are those people who um, had, you know, I had, you laugh at this, but I had a client call, someone called, and says, can you help my grandmother? I said, what's wrong with your grandmother? <laughs> well, you see, when she was 16, she became a Hindu. And this is in 1960-something. And she became a Hindu then, and married a Hindu man, and had Hindu, Hindu children, Hindu grandchildren, and Hindu great-grandchildren. I happen to be one of those along the line. She went to get her my card, it says Islam. So then they said, produce the exit order from the Sharia court. But she said, what exit order are you talking about? In 1960-something, the law wasn't that. But they said, no, no, ini perintah dari atas, lah, so kita kena ikut. So what is she supposed to do? Ign ignore the fact that she's been married as a Hindu, and as Hindu uh, uh, descendants, all of whom have suddenly, with the stroke of one officer in the NRD, been declared to be illegitimate. You know, how does that work? Okay, so this is the second category. So we said, look, after 2001, then we talk. Pre-2001, you can't restrict, because choices have been made. In another case I've, I've dealt with, where um, a man who was given approval by NRD to change his name on the basis of embracing of Christianity, has a child, who's now 12, goes to get his mic cut, the, the father, and he's told that he's a Muslim, even though he has NRD letters to say okay. All done through lawyers. 
when we ask why, oh ini dari atas lah kita kena ikut perintah kan macam mana polisi macam ni all that, you tak suka, you pergi ke mahkamah then of course they come and say you go and fight it in the Sharia court so nobody wants to actually deal with this so we brought this one up and then the third category are those people who embraced Islam for purpose of marriage and either their husbands have deserted them or the husbands have died and so on and now they want to go back to their own faith because one of the reasons is because their, their families will not accept them otherwise so what, we just leave them languishing in this, in this, in this limbo um, and what about those situations where a mother who had two children who converted to marry her children can't inherit now from her her natural children so those of us who practice in this area have come up with extremely elaborate schemes of trust and so on and so forth to try and just do what's right for the children of the... Those are the realities. So we put all of this before the Prime Minister and we said, look, I'm sure there's some sort of policy directive that can be taken on this. Attorney General was sitting right next to us. He said, yeah, 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 yeah. And that was five years ago, four years ago, whatever it was, and nothing's happened. There's no desire because the political will for change on this is not there because it's just very, very... <laughs> difficult for them to, in their minds, explain their positions to stakeholders. Now, as far as the courts are concerned, the Sharia court is nothing more than an inferior tribunal in the legal sense. All right? Now, the, court, the Sharia court is not created by the Constitution. Get that straight. It is only the superior courts, as we call them in law, in legal speak, the High Court, Court of Appeal, and the Federal Court that are created by the Constitution invested with the judicial power of the federation okay then the constitution says but by federal law or state law as the case may be the magistrates courts and and the sessions courts and the islamic courts can be created so those are creatures of statute when you talk of courts as creatures of statute they are circumscribed by the laws that create them the jurisdiction they can be vested with is the jurisdiction vested in them by the laws that establish them and do all of that, okay? So the constitution doesn't create the Sharia court. It says you can create a Sharia court and the, and the jurisdiction of these courts shall be delineated by federal law or state, sorry, state law and shall be only over persons who profess the religion of Islam, okay? So many people got upset when we use this term inferior tribunal they say oh you're insulting islam i said no i'm not i'm just describing it as a legal concept and in a case called latifa zain the federal court finally agreed with us and said yes it is a court of the same standing as a magistrate or sharia court but it's a creature of statute all right so if you go back to che omache so that court is only intended to address matters of personal law where there is a dispute nothing more but over the years, because of politicizing, now we're talking and hearing about AG of uh, Sharia courts, AG uh, Chief Justice of Sharia courts, and they're asking for equality of treatment between the superior courts and the Sharia courts. Now I'm all for ambition and aspiration. <laughs> all right, but I think we have to respect the limitations of the system, and the system says you are nothing more than just that. Sorry, you know you are like a magistrate or a whatever nothing more than that you cannot equate yourself with the but then confusion has happened because some of our civil judges become sharia appellate, appellate judges and they confuse their roles and when they sit as sharia appellate judges they think they're actually appeals judges in the court of appeal because they're vested with that sort of pomp and circumstance so then this confusion and this mudding of waters happens all right so really to answer your question their role is very minimal <coughs> nothing more than that Okay? There are people out there who would like their role to be much bigger. And that's why we have this discussion now about the place of Islam in the Constitution. Let me just say that the entire argument about status of Islam in this country is revisionist. It rejects constitutionalism as it was intended and as it is. It's a revisionist ambition that some quarters want to see for whatever reason. It is not the true state of affairs. All right? And part of the problem is the way in which constitutional law is being taught in our uh, schools. Right? If Aziz Bari was here, I would say that to his face as well. Because I've said it in, in other forums to his face. Um, <laughs> because, you know, when you say that this is how it should be, and then you stop and do not tell students this is how it actually is and why it is, these graduates will start thinking this is how it is. 
and not this. And then these graduates become officers of the Attorney General's chambers, and then suddenly they're on the High Court bench. And suddenly they're making law like Lena Joy and, and so on and so forth. So once and for all, I think we have to be very clear that the High Court of Justice here is empowered with all the necessary powers to give effect to the Constitution. If there's any doubt amongst you, the lawyers, look at the Judicature Act, look at item one of the schedule. It says that the High Court can make any orders to give effect to any and all of the part two rights in the Constitution. We start with the right to life and liberty, to the, to the protection of property and adequate compensation for, for acquisition, all the way through. And you've got to look at all these rights in a prismatic fashion because it fashions the, the protective uh, umbrella around us that defends us from the excesses of the state. Now the excesses of the state are not just by federal government, it's by state government, state agencies, including the Islamic bureaucracy. All right, And that then leads you into this discussion about how it is that they perceive Islam and how they then use that power to, to uh, enforce what they consider to be what it is, what it is, and how it interferes with our private lives. You know, so I hope that's answered your question. But the reality is, the, the high courts are fully empowered to do what they have to do, and they can if they want to. Is any more question? Yes. Hello. Um, I have a, uh, my name is Azizong. I want to ask a question to Dr. Ahmad Faro. Uh, it's a question about uh, Ruku Negara or national principle. So we are talking about how secular is our country, but in national principle, the first one, the top of the list is believing God. Second is uh, loyalty to the king and, and uh, loyalty to king and country. The third one is upholding the constitution. So if the third one in the list, so if the principle have belief in God and put the constitution as the third one, and we make it as a national principle, do you think that this is, the Ruku Negara actually is a good thing for our kids? Because I saw the Ruku Negara in my secondary and primary school. So it's like a brainwash to, to make this is a lower thing than the believing God and king and country. So, thank you. <laughs> well, actually, we can open the answers to all the panels um, if Well, if, if uh, I think that question actually more on uh, the hierarchy of the laws, whether Rukun Nagara comes first uh, in, in, in our laws uh, or the federal constitution. So it's, I think it's suitable for the lawyers to answer. Um, I, I do not really get your question. Yeah. I mean, they just yes, we, because we are talking about how secular is our constitution, yeah. but in the national principle, we put the first one as belief in God. Yeah. So you can never separate this thing. Mm -hmm. So, for example, LGBT rights, you cannot put into the constitution as a rule of law because the first one, you are saying you must believe in God. In our country, that one would mean Islam. Mm -hmm. So certain rights won't be entertained. So this kind of thing. Well, I, I think uh, it is for, from my point of view, maybe Malik and Nizam has uh, different ideas. <coughs> but I think I've explained earlier on that it was clearly stated in our, our constitution about equality, right? So meaning to say that irrespective of our race and creed, we are all equals, okay? All among equals. Meaning to say that they should not be um, uh, how do I say, Malay supremacy above the others. Or uh, to say that, you know, there are certain minorities that um, that uh, do not have rights. For example, the LGBT communities, LGBT communities, for example. So meaning to say that um, rights should be given to everyone, religious or sexual minorities, right? is is invested in our in our constitution. And this belief in God is basically a local negara, right? It's uh, belief in God doesn't mean that you have to be Muslim to believe in God. You can also be Christian and you believe in God, right? So it, I, I don't think there's any um, 
um, how do I say, I don't think it's fair to say that if you believe in God, so it must be, you know, you must put Islam above everything else. Yes, Islam is the, as, as stated in the constitution, is the um, religion of, of, of the federation. But, but then it is still, um, you know, in officially religion of federation, as I explained just now. And I, I don't see any contradiction in that. I don't know, maybe Malik and Islam would like to explain for that. Um, okay. Personally speaking, I don't find a problem with Rukun Nagara stating that you should believe in God. In principle, there's no issues there. Because if you look at the constitution, there are two aspects to it. There is the non-secular as aspect, nine schedule is two. Make whatever laws you want regarding religion, no issues. But the key thing to understand is Article 74 sub 3, fundamental liberties triumphs over all else. So whatever laws that you want to make about religion, it cannot rest away my rights as a citizen. Any fundamental liberties that's guaranteed to me under the federal constitution, you cannot take it away from me. And that includes the rights of LGBT communities. It doesn't make a difference. Um, I'm just trying to understand what you think we should do with them. <laughs> you think we should? You think we should just exterminate them, or what? Because you see this kind of uh, the in behind of the exercise book in primary school. The same exercise book. Hey, it's a kind of, it's a kind of like, uh, um, I like call propaganda also from the government. I don't think there's anything wrong with government stating a, 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 a aspiration or, or policy statement or anything of, of that nature. But you know, in, in this kind of discussion, what sometimes confuses me is, yeah, we say, oh, that's not that kind of person we don't like. That kind of person we don't like. And the general thinking is, whatever we don't like, we just ask them to leave the country. <laughs> you know, um, from LGBTs to people who don't support the Barisan to Chinese people who are, you know, Patriots or whatever it is, <laughs> you know, that sort of thinking is completely wrong, you know. Um, so to say that for that, because the Rukun, I'm not disagreeing with you, I get your point, but um, uh, to say that the Rukun Nagara says belief in God is a fundamental principle, therefore we are all must believe in God, and therefore we must believe in just the Islamic God, and nothing more, I think it's taking it a bit far. But we must believe that the freedom of religion doesn't necessarily mean freedom to believe in a religion. It's also the freedom not to believe in any religion, if that's what we think it is. You know, and, and that's not me saying it. It's, it's, it's jurisprudence and international law on the subject going back, you know, many, many years. But, you know, when we hear some of our administrators talk, it's as if it's one or nothing. So in which case, then, in their mind, they probably have this imaginary island where, you know, okay, we don't like LGBTs, you go there. Atheists are okay, that island as well. Uh, heretics, okay, there. And then soon that country will be bigger than this country in terms of its population size. You know, it's just nonsensical, really. We've got to find a way to address the fact that people have different views and different thoughts about things. And that's why we're created the way we are. If you go back to the Islamic uh, texts, that's why we were created, to get to know each other, to understand how it all works. And in all of that, we see the diversity of, of, of God or, and His vision, or, as you see God in your own way, right? So, um, somewhere along the way, we lost sight of that, because the, the um, maybe short-term thinking... I, I was at a forum where Justice Shankar was speaking, and he was one of the architects of the Law Reform Marriage Divorce Act which came into force in 76, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And he expressed some concern that he had excluded Muslims from the ambit of the law when they drafted that act. Because prior to that act coming into force, there was actually no restriction about the marriage between Muslims and non-Muslims. Did you know that? Yeah. Right? So those of you who are senior enough will know <laughs> that it's only then that it became a problem and then suddenly everyone had to go and get married in the Islamic courts. Now, if you look at the way Islam is practiced in India, and as much as some of us don't like to admit it, you know, we learn a lot of our Islam from India. We'd rather think it came from the Arabian Peninsula because therefore it makes us purer Muslims. I don't understand that, but, but the truth of it is a lot of it came on the back of merchants' ships into, into Malaya. And in India, which has, you know, a huge Islamic population with a rich Islamic history, uh, there's no problem between 
saying, okay, if you want to get married under Islamic law, then you follow what the Islamic law prescribes. But you are entitled to marry under civil law if you don't want to follow what the Islamic law prescribes. So you have Shah Rukh Khan married to a non-Muslim. And he's got no problems visiting the Prime Minister who hosts him. Although that's kawat according to our laws. Because he's not officially married as a Muslim to a Muslim. You get me? So if, we, if, if I'm not complaining about anybody, I'm just saying as an example. So if, if you can see an Islamic a, a country in which there's so many Muslims having no difficulty adopting a course in that way, then what makes us so special? Why do we have to be so different? And the reality is, if you look at our constitutional underpinnings, they're very similar to the Indian constitution. And in 1957, if our administrators have thought the issue through a little bit, it could be that we would have the same similar situation here, like they have in Singapore as well. Although Singapore now is not allowed to marry Malaysian Muslims in civil ceremonies uh, in, in that country. So it calls for imagination. It calls for some, um, uh, every one of us being relaxed and at ease with what we have. And somewhere we've stopped being relaxed and at ease with what we have, and we feel this constant need to define and redefine, and we, we constantly feel that we're under siege. We have to protect ourselves from what? You know, Zaid Ibrahim said in one speech, uh, you know, I think it was a good speech, um, why do the Malays believe that they're under siege? They're the majority. Siege from what? Why do the Muslims feel they're under siege? They're the majority as well. You know, and the Malay Muslim majority is that. It's very evident. So what's the, who, why are they under siege? But yet, when we have these policies articulated and the, and the, and the measures taken, it's always demi uh, Islam, demi uh, Bangsa. Who's, who's putting you under threat? I don't get it. Yeah? Yes, the gentleman there. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm S.P. Chung. I come from an NGO that deals with reproductive rights. Um, okay, I, I think that uh, one of the interesting things that uh, was brought up was the statement, I think, in, uh, uh, that was made about the function of Sharia courts, that it is a court where, where there's a dispute you go to the court to settle the dispute between, uh, uh, between Muslims. Uh, but I was just look, looking at the role of the Sharia courts recently, and it looks like it is actually not just a court uh, that deals with uh, disputes, but it is an organization that actually enforces the law outside of, of, of its dispute. That means they, they have officers that they go out and regulate and, and, and punish people, right? So I mean, one of the areas that, of, of course, is, is de that uh, affects women greatly is in their sexual rights. And one of the uh, uh, facts that came out recently uh, was a fact about how single women who become pregnant, if they go and deliver and they get married, you know, after the after the fact, if their pregnancy is less than uh, if their marriage period is less than six months, by the time they deliver, they are treated differently. The child is no longer uh, 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 named after the father, and he's got to have a separate what we call uh, identity, and is a bin or binti Abdullah. Now that actually actually creates uh, a permanent scar on that person's name to say, why isn't he named after his father, you know? And it really becomes a problem for a lot of women because if they think they are going to deliver and they are already pregnant before they get married and they're going to deliver before that period, it is a problem for them. So very often they seek an abortion simply because of that. I think that's very serious. The second problem is that, uh, you know, as doctors, you know, we are all sworn to secrecy in terms of our relationship with our clients. But when a patient goes to a government hospital, a Muslim girl gets pregnant and has a problem, she's not married, she can be reported to the Sharia court and she can be prosecuted. I mean, here again, you're talking about, you know, <laughs> what is the power of the Sharia courts in telling the NRG what they should do? 
in telling the, the hospital staff what they should do in relation to a Muslim woman. I think it's quite terrible. But I mean, in terms of the legal structures that we have, uh, is there any way we can put that right? Thank you. Uh, doctor, can I just clarify, is that a requirement by uh, the government hospital doctors to report on uh, authorities uh, if they found out that? Well, I, I would say that, I, you know, we are not actually sure how the information gets to the Majlis Agama. But it, but it obviously it doesn't happen all the time, but, but whenever it happens, basically it is a breach of confidentiality and actually, in a civil court, that person can sue the hospital for releasing that information to an unauthorized body. And, but it's not done, you know? I mean, people are so frightened that they just go along with it. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think I'll just clarify one thing. I, I don't think that, uh, as far as I know, in Malaysia, doctors don't get involved with all those kind of nitty-gritty things. I mean, they have to register to basically the staff at the hospital, right? okay? And these are the people, these administrators, who will be, you know, bringing the jaki with jais and so on and so forth, and you know, reporting these kind of things. And of course, and uh, I got a lot of complaints uh, saying that, uh, you know, they, in fact, I'm not sure whether there was a circular or not, but from the what, JPN saying that, you know, like, before they register, they have to calculate, they have to, like, produce their uh, marriage certificate, and you have to calculate. I mean, uh, the dates from the, uh, the, I mean, the birth and the date of nikah, I mean, does it tell you? I mean, does it, I mean, is, uh, I mean it must be, like, nine months or minimum of, Six months. What? If it's less than that, then it's considered illegal or something like that. It cannot be bin something, but must be bin or binti abdullah, which is, like you said, it will leave a permanent scar to the, to the child. Right? So this is very bad. And I think Nizam was in a forum organized by SIS uh, recently, uh, and we discussed about this issue. And to us, that uh, even Mufti uh, Juanda Jaya, the, currently the Portuguese Mufti, right? He was there, and like, you know, it shouldn't have been the case, right? Shouldn't have been the case. But that's the problem when the state wanted to impose their own version of Islam to the society. And it's very bad because, as you said, you know, it leaves a permanent scar, right? And, you know, it, it's going to be a problem to the child later on in life. And, and I'm very much against this, this kind of thing. And then, of course, you know, like uh, it's very unfair to the to the, especially to the mother as well, right? She could be persecuted just for having a child considered to be not within the period of uh, you know of from marriage to to birth of the child. Yeah, is that? Um, from a civil law perspective, there are two issues. Yeah. Um, in relation to children who are illegitimate um, under Islamic law. Um, firstly, I, I agree with you that it's a travesty that a child is unable to enjoy a name that have, you know, the child's mother or father wants to give to the child. Um, and, and the problem arises in particular when the child is being registered, JPN will tell them, you can't put any other name except for bin Abdullah or bin Ti Abdullah. That's one. The other issue is, in the birth certificate, what happens is, there is also a further identification, which signifies that the child is illegitimate. It's called a Section 13 registration. And, and I think those two um, stigmatizes the child unnecessarily, and I think certainly is unwarranted. Because if you look at Article 5 of the Federal Constitution, Article 5 effectively guarantees a child a right to name especially when both parents are quite happy to give the child a name of their choice. So this idea that a child which is legitimate must have a bin or binti Abdullah is actually something that the state has come up with. In effect, this, this uh, notion of a child being given a bin or binti is actually not, not rooted in religion, it's actually rooted in culture. 
it is Arabic culture that 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 uh, I suppose there's this custom of of putting the child as bin or binti. So even if you go by the nine schedule, I don't see it as justifying the state as preventing a child from enjoying a name that the, 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 that the child um, is able to enjoy, as long as the father or mother is prepared to give the child whatever name, yeah? Um, and, and you can see that stigmatization actually taking place not only just at the point of time the child is, is, uh, is being, being registered at birth, but even when the child is being registered at school, even when the child is being married off. Because the father, in the case of a child that's legitimate, yeah, especially since everyone would know, is prevented from standing as, as the person who gives away the child when the child is being married away. And I think that's also wrong, because that's a matter that's private between the father or the family and the child. So why should that be made known to the public? And I, I think certainly there are repercussions which, which are uh, long-lasting and serious to the child. And, and you know, this is one of those areas of the law which needs to be revisited and, 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 and certainly be challenged in court. I think this also raises a question about uh, moral policing and, and why it happens. And you know, in, um, in a, maybe in a dramatic example, if I were to ask you, what do you think happens in these villages in Pakistan and Nigeria where women are stoned or killed for doing things which in the view of their uh, village, village, fellow villagers is wrong? What do you think that's about? I say to you that's moral policing as well. So if you, if you abhor the kind of things that are happening in those countries, then I'd ask you to think about whether what we're seeing here, where individuals feel it necessary to morally police their fellow Muslims, is this a question of the same thing but in a matter of, as a matter of degree, right? So it comes back then to what, what's happening in the minds of those people who feel the need to, to, uh, to do this sort of thing, to, to, to complain, to uh, say, oh, that person's acted in a way that's wrong. Etc. Etc. What's compelling those people to do that? And I think, you know, in the years that I've I've given some thought to this, it comes back to that issue again of how satisfied we are as individuals, you know, and it goes back to that basic issue of identity and and all the rest of it. Because you know, I mean, someone like us might not to say that we're less, or Dr. Farouk might not feel necessary to do what they do, which is to call up the authorities and say, "Did you know I saw someone <laughs> hiding behind the window, the door there, eating during fasting month?" All right? But then there are obviously people out there who do that sort of thing for kicks or what, I don't know. But they do it. And so, why? And you, we can't just dismiss it as just idiosyncrasy. I think it's more than that. I think it points to some sort of systemic failings that have led to us being so, you know, um, narrow in our conception of what our lives are about here. And, and, and somewhere in all of that, we've developed this thing about the other. And that's very dangerous. When we start looking at our fellow Malaysians as the other, and then we can treat them as less than human or whatever it is, that's, that's, that speaks of racial intolerance, it speaks of religious intolerance, it speaks of oh, so many uh, things that are worry, worrisome. Uh, okay, before I just want to ask some uh, online questions that we have coming in. Um, so. Okay, since um, I allowed this question because uh, none of you are politicians, maybe not yet. <laughs> so, this is um, a question f from one anonymous um, person. Uh, does a Muslim has the right to freedom of religion under our federal constitution and Sharia laws that we have currently? So, this is open to all. I think the answer's been put out there already. Um, we've heard the Islamic perspective. As things stand, uh, all the courts say that is, but exercise it through the Sharia court. I don't think that's freedom. We've argued in um, several cases now that when you give a discretion to a judge to decide whether or not you can have freedom, that's not freedom. That's a feta. Now, if they said that the process was merely, purely administrative, and just to record, like it used to be in Negri Sambilan, you could just go to the majlis and record the fact that you've now left the religion. Uh, that's fine. That's administrative. But as long as, uh, this is my view, as long as we have a system that obliges us to surrender our decision to a, 
to a judge and leave it to that judge's discretion, then I don't think we can say we have freedom in, in, in any sense. Can I just add this? Huh? That I think there's a bit of a logical fallacy in suggesting that you can go to the Sharia courts to get permission to leave Islam. If you accept and assume for one moment that apostasy is a crime in Islam, and it is legislated as a crime in Islam, how do you go to court and ask for permission to commit a crime? But then there's no legislation against apostasy. The, the charge is usually insulting Islam. They don't say you can. And you know why they don't enact laws to say that you can't apostatize? apostatize? Because once you're an apostate and they charge you for it, they recognize that you're no longer a Muslim. So they don't have jurisdiction. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, I would like to raise uh, one important point. That I, I really have a problem in reconciliating these uh, uh, arguments made by Pompeo and you know all these uh, Muslim groups uh, who are against, so much against apostasy. Because uh, what's the whole idea behind it? You know, as I said earlier on, that you know, it comes from the heart. Faith is of the same fabric as love. So as much as you cannot enforce love, you cannot enforce faith, right? Cannot be done by force. So meaning to say that if you're preventing someone from leaving a religion, he does he or she doesn't have faith anymore. Meaning to say you are trying to create a community of hypocrites. What's that is? What's the purpose? What's the point of it? Right? It it defeats the purpose at all. So basically, you are creating this this community of hypocrites. And I don't think uh, in, in Islam, you know, you are supposed to be that. And are you proud to have um, the numbers than the qualities? So that's the question that we have to pose to them, basically. Just to add, um, it's quite fascinating. The Pakistani uh, constitution says Sharia is the supreme law. It's not like ours, which says that the constitution is the supreme law, right? So that's a big difference. And that goes back to what Dr. Farouk said earlier, that if you say the basic law of the country is Islamic law, then you can say it's Islamic state, because all laws have to conform with the Quran, and the Hadith, and so on and so forth. So there's a role for the um, uh, ulama to play in that process of reconciling the laws with, with Islam. Okay, but ours isn't like that. But anyway, there's a case from the Pakistani High Court, maybe the Supreme Court, I think it's the High Court, which we referred our courts to a while ago, and it's interesting because you had one, one side saying that the other side was not Muslim. I think it involved in Ahmadiyya. And you had the High Court judge, or maybe Supreme Court now, saying that, well, who are we to look into the hearts of that person, heart of that person, to say whether or not that person is a Muslim or not? How do we know? How do we, because he's saying he is, um, so who are we to say otherwise? And they quoted a verse from the Quran, um, uh, to this effect, I'm sorry, I've not got the, the exact language, but um, only God is closer to you than the jugular vein. And they cited that verse in the decision of the High Court there to say that it, the, only, the only entity that could know exactly what's going on, if you believe in that, in that system, is God. So we are not going to usurp that function. So in Kamaria Ali, I was arguing against the Attorney General, our current Attorney General, um, and he said that he was the, uh, the he said he was the attorney general of the Muslims, and he had an obligation to defend uh, the the faith. So I said, you know, I'm very heartened by this, but I'd like to remind him that he's also the attorney general of the rest of the country, <laughs> right? And um, so when he says that my clients at the back who say they are not Muslims are Muslims, then how does he know? And then we cited this. And I said that, well, you know, it's, it shocks me that all of us so-called learned individuals at the fore of the court, including the five judges, are sitting here debating the religion of the people at the back of the court when all we have to do is ask them. <laughs> but we didn't want to, you know, and that, that shows you how really incongruous the, the entire structure is. And the one thing he did say there was, if we allowed persons to... Um, uh, renounce faith, change their religions in and out, in and out, which I think is quite insulting really because that doesn't give any credit to people's faith. Uh, but assuming that were the case, then how would we be able to enforce Islamic laws? 
So the objective seems to be, as was stated earlier by Harding, the objective seems more about policing and enforcing Islamic laws, making it convenient, therefore you have a mindset which says Islam, rather than actually giving credence to the choices or belief of the individual. And that's the, the, the dynamic or the dialectic that's been set up in this, in this political scheme that's, that's developed over the years. Just, just a short comment. <coughs> this one of the arguments being put forward by Kambela uh, many years ago, in the case of Lin Joy, for example, was that if we allow people to, uh, to uh, become apostate, all right, meaning to say that we are opening the floodgate, they like to use this word, floodgate, opening the floodgate. <laughs> now, my argument is that faith is not like choosing between Coke and Pepsi. You know, one day you want to just Coke, the next day you want to just Pepsi. It's not like that. It's, it's so dear to us. You know, how can they say that it's opening a floodgate? It's ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. It's just good for argument's sake, but it just doesn't make sense. That's all. Sorry, I'm jumping in again. And there's no data to support this, you see. Uh, we have assertions made by various people that there are 250,000, X hundred thousand, but there's no re real data to support it. You know? And uh, many years ago, I got a phone call from someone saying, you know, uh, I understand that you can help me. I don't, I don't, what do you want? He says, I need to know how I can uh, convert out. I said, well, why do you want to do that? He says, you see, because I've got this girlfriend and I want to marry her, I really love her. And she's not Muslim, and she doesn't want to convert in, so I guess I have no choice because, you know, what do I do? I said, well, I think it's a bit complicated, but could I just ask you a few questions? He said, yeah, sure. The first question, he said, don't lecture me about the Quran. He said that, I remember that. Then he said, my first question was, are you aware, are you Malay? He says, yes. I said, are you aware that if you gave up your religion, you would no longer be entitled to Bhumiputra privileges? Yeah, good. Oh, okay, then never mind, no problem. <laughs> And I need to change my religion. <laughs> that, that's the other part of it. You know, when we talk about constitutional definition of Malay, we forget that that's a legal definition to a certain end, which is that if you are going to have affirmative action or privileges under the constitution, then you need a definition. So a person who professes the religion of Islam practices the custom and speaks the language. So if you're no longer a Muslim, then you can't get entitlement, but you can still be a Malay socially and, and, and anthropologically, yeah. you know, you have to be. What else are you? Uh, yes, the, the gentleman, this one first, then... <coughs> Don't worry, there are many, there, we have plenty more times, so... Uh, okay, I'll be kind of smile, okay. Uh, pertamanya, uh, undang-undang syariah memang tak benarkan untuk uh, murtad or apostasy. There's no law. Okay, one thing lah. Okay. Because uh, murtad ni atau apostasy pada seorang yang memang amalkan Islam. Macam kata lah macam saya. Dia lahir, dia besarkan, dia ajar, dia amal sampai sekarang. Suddenly, tiba-tiba saya nak tukar agama. Yes, I kena buat ke mahkamah. Hakim akan dengar. Kenapa I nak tukar agama? It will be a criminal case. The state will prosecute me. Why? Jadi, I give three hours on my, all my facts. Okay? So, this fact will be challenged by the state. And will convince the judge. Whether I need Islam ke or ke bukan Islam. Do I can boleh tidak. After settling all the trial case, the judge says, no. You cannot denounce Islam. We tak boleh process. Kalau you not juga, you put to death. There's a punishment. So, it's fair. Because I've been robbed as a Muslim. I understand what I've said, what I claim, and so on, so on. So we have a problem to listen to my case. But here in Malaysia, first, there's no law. Okay? Second thing, there's no procedure. And thirdly, the judge has no power, no jurisdiction. But still, we have to go to the Sharia court. So, very unfortunate because the last few years, the Court of Appeal, Sharia Court of Appeal, allowed not apostasy but a declaration that you today is no more Muslim. It's two different things. It's been argued, it's two different things. Even recently, inshallah, Selangor, just recently, about a few months back, one judge did allow, after I waited for almost 10 years, 
did allow under that ground. Why? Because the applicant come to the court saying, see, I'm not a Muslim. I've been brought up as a Hindu. All my families are Hindu. These are my, my, my preaching. I understand this. I don't understand Quran. I don't understand about Puasa. I don't understand. So going through after four years, then only the court decide. Why? Because there's a lacuna in the, the process. Okay. So as regard for the question of freedom, right? yes, one may think that, oh, I have a freedom to whatever religion that I found off. Okay? But I believe that whatever religion, whether Islam or non-Muslim, whatever it is, there are certain uh, requirement that the, the one who preach that religion must adhere to the rulings. It don't simply that, oh, you can simply change kejap Christian, kejap Islam, no, no, no such thing. I believe that. Lah. Okay? So, the understanding of freedom here, you best very, memang kena teliti lah, mana kena betul-betul berhati-hati when you say freedom. Because it make, uh, it, they will transpire macam-macam. Whether you're a believer or you're a non-believer, what? What do you mean by your freedom? Or your feeling? Or your punya hatred? What? So the, the term of freedom tu, maaf punya pandangan lah. <laughs> Better be careful nak cakap freedom tu. <laughs> Because takut nanti, orang salah faham. Orang salah taksir. Dan bila salah saya taksir, then kita ada satu chop. Orang mintas, malik, I don't like you. For instance, eh? So you you block yourself to the facts. You yang create problem to to yourself. Jadi you not in your freedom, for instance, right? So uh, talking about religion, uh, we don't simply say about religion. We must understand religion. Kita Muslim, we must read Islam. We don't say, oh, I'm born Muslim, I should read Islam. No, 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 no such thing. Kalau you kata Islam, you must read Islam sampai I am mati. If you say you Christian, you read Christianity sampai habis and so so forth. Alright, so my view is that maknanya uh, I took the other side, meaning that the Sharia court is and the Sharia court is developing, but very unfortunate as it's the level is tribunal, yes. very unfortunate. So I don't know, tamu dan tamu sultan selang pun ada somewhere. <laughs> okay, anyway, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that is a statement, or unless the pan the panel have anything to say. Uh, in response to the statement made by the gentleman? Um, there's an interesting verse in the Quran, you know. Um, I think it's Surah al -Hujra. Um I may be paraphrasing it a bit, but it goes along something along the lines like this. Huh? God made us into tribes so that we can tell us from one another. Now that verse is not just a verse relating to the fact that there should be no discrimination on the basis of race in Islam. It's also a very interesting verse in the sense that it's a verse which recognizes that each of us may have a different appreciation as to what a particular verse may mean. So in effect, it comes back to the point that Dr. Farouk made earlier. This notion that Islam is this monolith, there's only one way to look at Islam. I think it's not the right way to look at it. As far as I'm concerned, Islam is your, you know, it's basically like Baskin Robbins, there's 39 flavors, there's no problems. Yeah? So it may very well be that some of us take the view that you can't apostatize. Fine, no problems, that's for you. But for others, we look at Surah Yunus verse 99, we look at Surah Al-Baqarah verse 256, and we say that freedom of conviction is fundamental in Islam. It's a God-given right. And it makes no sense to enforce faith on another person force him to perform religious actions which he doesn't believe in sincerity niyat, is fundamental in islam the person must be sincere you can't force someone to go and pray for example you can't make a machine and ask him to pray and say that you're going to get good deeds as a consequence of that he said in fact contrary to all all ideals in islam so when when we you know i suppose legislate when we um, prevent someone from leaving Islam, I think actually we're doing an injustice to that person. And not only that, we're doing an injustice to God. We're doing an injustice to Islam. That's, that's the way I look at it. Um, and, and, and I accept that maybe the notion of freedom is uncomfortable for some people, but uh, I think freedom is, is God-given, you know? And I don't think it's, very, it's, it's something that's uncomfortable to God, because God has got no problems with freedom. I'll just make a quick comment. 
Uh, basically, I would like to go a little bit further from where uh, Nizam stopped by saying that, you know, to me, right, freedom uh, means everything. It's not only freedom to believe in God, but also freedom to sin, right? So that is why, you know, like, I promote or I'm basically for a secular state because for Muslims to be able to be true Muslims, they must live in a secular state. State that will not enforce their ideas about how Islam is to be uh, practiced to the to the citizen, to its citizens, right? So meaning to say that if we like um, how do I say, if we feel that, okay, if someone wants to drink, for example, then it's just his moral choice, right? It is his moral choice, and the repercussion is his. That's the freedom to sin, right? His, <laughs> what I'm trying to say that, the reason for him not to drink is not because he's scared of Jais or Jakim, not because of religious authority, because he believes that there is God. Many of us stay in uh, abroad, right? In the States or in Australia or in, in the UK. And many of us, you know, like uh, pops were open until 10 or 11 at night, right? But I guess, I believe, many of us who adhere to the Islamic principles would prefer not to go to these pubs, even though. They, I mean, uh, uh, is easily available. I mean, uh, you can you can uh, basically drink whatever you want, or you can uh, have uh, um, relationship in whatever ways you want, right? But it's the God consciousness inside of you that will basically deter you from doing certain things. And that is the only way that for you to become good Muslims. So it must come from inside, from within you, not because of fear of state apparatus that is looking or surveilling, uh, having a surveillance upon you, right? So that's that's the most important thing that I want to say about about freedom. Okay, um, um, the gentleman there. Sorry, doc. Uh, we must give chance to others. Yeah, thanks. Good morning to all the speaker. My name is Nche. Uh, this this uh, first issue I would uh, like to uh, uh, direct to Dr. Farouk. Dr. Farouk just now mentioned that non-Malays are second-class citizens. I don't agree with you. Non-Malays are fourth-class citizens. <laughs> I say this is intended. I don't, although I don't believe in the fourth-class citizen, I say this to you. The first-class citizen is the uh, Aboriginal people in the in the land the orang asli. The second class is Malay. The third class are Malays who come from Indonesia and Philippines. They come by Sampang, tomorrow they get their blue IC, they become Ubi Putra, all right? I'm the third generation of Malaysian, I'm still a non Ubi Putra, all right? And so that, that's the reason why I become a fourth class, all right? <laughs> now, uh, concerning the uh, freedom of religions, uh, I, I, I do agree that uh, the speakers here are moderates, but uh, most of you are preaching to non -Malays. You look at the club today. How many Muslims are here? They are far in between. These are all there, there are quite a few here, actually. Yeah. <laughs> far in between. These are all non -Malays. Sitting here are all Malays in front. <laughs> So the, the, the point I want to make is, you have to preach it to the right communities. This is the wrong communities anyway, all right? Now, uh, you are talk about equalities before the law. I just want to ask one question. Is equalities apply to transsexuals, LGBT? They did not choose their life that way. They are born to be that them. Why discriminate against them? Now, if you, as a parent, have that child with you, 
how would you feel that he is discriminated by the whole country? All right, that's one question. Now, concerning non-Muslim, how far the law, the constitution protects the non-Muslim right in this country? Thank you. Thank you very much. I will just briefly answer the well the statement earlier about uh, preaching to the converted. Uh, it's true, uh, most of you probably uh, already uh, agree with whatever the panel are saying, but this is not a close uh, forum. We have advertised, we have uh, tell everyone, I try to persuade our own lawyers stop uh, Google, you know, many Malays there who are very pro-Islamic view to come, uh, but of course, you know, this, as I said earlier on about a panel of speakers that we are trying to seek, we try to seek uh, a variety of opinions, uh, you know, especially from the Majlis Peguam Malaysia, uh, you know, what they are, because they are very uh, pro-Islamic view on the, on the, uh, our federal constitution. But, ah, no, uh, yeah, sorry, what is it, Majlis, no, Majlis, uh, Peguam Muslim Malaysia, uh, Persatuan Peguam Muslim Malaysia. Uh, we try to get, uh, you know, at least a rep. We don't need the president or vice president. Nobody wants 80 chambers. Nobody sent anyone. So we try to get a variety of people to come. And, you know, but what to do? Only people like you all who are interested to hear. So now I will leave the, the, the rest of the questions to be answered by the panel. Let me begin with a confession, yeah? Uh, in, the, in the first place, you see there's someone like Encik Abdul Kadeh here with us today. And I, I think it's, it's quite good that he's taken the time to be with us, to listen to what we have to say. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, it's not necessarily that we are, or at least I'm, I don't know whether I'm correct. But I think the point of all of this is to have a dialogue, to have a discussion, to understand our respective viewpoints. Uh, I would say, about maybe five to eight years ago, I probably had a very different perspective. I was very conservative. Uh, and it is true the credit of efforts of persons like Jamal Ibtias that I'm actually here today talking about these things. So viewpoints changed. We appreciate our religion better. We appreciate the constitution better. Um, you see, there may be things that we are told about what is supposedly black or white in our religion, yeah? But I think as you live life, you experience life, you get to know people, you understand the pains that they go through, the grievances they have, you can't help but be compassionate about their problems. You sit down with a transgender individual and you listen to him speak, oh well, sorry, if you listen to her speaking to you, you know, you, you can't help but, but sympathize with that person. And you have to say that, look, there must be another way. There can't be this, this can't be the only way where you punish and persecute that person. It's not fair to that person. So I, I think when we come to forums like this, um, we, we, I suppose, exchange views and we, you know, we see where we end up. I think it's not, it's not so important to sort of have this wave of change suddenly happening. You throw a stone into the pond, see the ripples and you know, see where you end up at some point. Who knows? Things happen. Um, when I was growing up in Penang, he's going to start shaking his head because he's saying I'm lecturing too much. Um, that uh, my family used to have quite regular prayer um, uh, gatherings for different events, and so there was one particular uh, elder uh, Muslim who was very close to the family. He may have been distantly related, I'm not sure, and he would generally be invited to do the the and all of that at home. Now, he was very, very strict. And, you know, amongst the things he used to say quietly to his family and to other people, thinking that we didn't hear it, was how my mom and dad were a little bit too rela relaxed with us, my brother and I. Okay, so anyway, he went on this way. And he had a, either a son or a nephew, I can't remember now, who, you know, was very much under his, his grasp, you know, and control in terms of whatever. Now, many years later, I'm in KL. So this, that was, my guess, maybe 20 years or so before, maybe 15. 
this happened some time ago. Many years I'm, later, I'm standing in, a, in an entertainment outlet in um, KL. <laughs> and this, um, this you know, young woman comes up to me. It's quite dark for her. So young woman comes up to me and says, hello. I'm thinking, I don't know this person. Why is this person speaking to me? As I say, I was politely uh, say yes, hello. And then as the conversation wore on a little bit, she said, don't you recognize me? And I said, no, I'm sorry, I don't. Thinking, oh no. <laughs> then she says, I'm so and so. And she named the name of that boy who had been coming with his dad to the religious prayer things. And I said, wait a minute, what happened? She says, what do you mean what happened, right? <laughs> I'm now so and so, right? I mean, full, in full uh, technicolor. And so, you know, somewhere along the way, she, this person had decided that she was now going to embrace the the true side of, of her, and it just reminds me that, you know, you can't necessarily dictate these things, and that would have been the last person you thought would have become this. Not that this is bad, but I'm just saying that transition was, was interesting, you know. So, you know, when we talk of what's right or what's wrong, the problem that, that strikes me constantly is this, right? If you think, just from a Muslim standpoint, so you say you're Sunni. All right. So, can, can you say that you're Shafi'i or Maliki or Hambali or you, you know what do you do? You know, you can't define it. Even the imams themselves said that you know it's open. But when they codify law here, the law that's codified is according to the Shafi'i school. All right. So what does that mean for a Muslim who says no? I don't actually agree with the Shafi'i theories. That I believe more with the Hambalis or or whatever. And then, what, what? Especially when you have a vast um, uh, uh, population of immigrants from India, which you know practiced different types of Islam, and not Shafi'i Islam, yeah, Hanafi, Hanafi Islam. And you know, if you look at our old cases from the law reports, you'll find cases. There's one. That, there's one that I, con I, I, I like a lot. It's about this Malay gentleman who was very upset that her, his daughter was dating. Uh, Indian Muslim, no, not not acceptable those days. Still, I guess. Um, and uh, he tried to put an end to that relationship. It didn't quite work. And then she disappeared. Next thing he knows, she's living with the the Indian Muslim boy. And so he brings habeas corpus proceedings to liberate his daughter from the from the clutches of that person who's obviously abducted her. You know why would she go otherwise? <laughs> um, and then she comes to court and says, wait a minute, I married him. And then he says, no, you can't because you need my consent as your wali, as your guardian. And she says, no, no, yesterday I became a Hanafi and I don't need wali anymore. <laughs> and you had a high court judge say, he, she's right. So that was the end of that, no habeas corpus allowed. So the point I'm making is, you know, sure, I accept that you may need some guidance from your but what sort of guidance defines it? That's the question. And what then empowers the state to decide that it's this and nothing else? That's the question. And then if you expand that, that a little bit more, you go into discussions about Shia Islam, you go into discussions about Ahmadi Islam, you go into discussions on other things like the place of LGBTs in, in Islam, etc., etc., etc. And in as much as you say this is the prevailing view, you cannot say with certainty that that's the only view. And the fact that there is a dichotomy of views, or more than two views, suggests that maybe the issue is not as subtle as we would like to think, even on the question of apostasy. You know, you have moderate views, you have modernist views, you have traditional views, etc., etc. So when you have all of that, and much more, then the question that comes up is, how do you say, with certainty, what is the state of Islamic law? Which then has to go back into ijtihad and so on and so forth. And that's the difficulty we have here, because we have a system of law that's based on enact, enact, enacting of legislative law. And that legislation is made in accordance with the constitution, not according to the decrees of a sultan or a, or a fatwa committee and so on and so forth. So that's, and that those laws have to be consistent with the constitutional structure and the freedoms, as Nizam has already pointed out. So that's where the problem starts. Now in all of this, a question comes up as to diversity. And the question is as equally relevant within the Islamic population as it is outside the Islamic population. 
So, some years ago, the British, a British High Commission invited four young Muslims, professionals, to basically do an exchange of views and so on. So, a whole bunch of us were invited to the British High Commission. A lot of these young entrepreneurs were there, Malays, Muslims. And the people that were invited were a banker, a dentist, a doctor, and uh, a lawyer. They are all about maybe late 20s, early 30s. And of course, a lot of the questions were, how do we engage in Islamic banking transactions, and how do we make money together, and all of that? OK, great. Then somebody, uh, might have been me, actually, I'm not sure, asked a question about how it is that Muslims, as minorities, in post-9-11, post-7th of July, uh, London, felt. because you would think that they were not protected because the law doesn't enact this web of Islamic laws around them to protect them because that's what we're told that these laws are for, to protect our religion. All right. So I said, I must have been meaning, I said, well, um, how do you feel about that as a Muslim? Do you think you need more laws to protect you? And one of them said something very interesting. She said, okay, the problem with saying yes to your suggestion means I have to start defining what a Muslim is. And how do I define a Muslim? Because do I say that the African Muslim is a Muslim? Do I say the or not a Muslim? How do I decide it? Then I said, well, we don't seem to have any problem with it. Then she says, I don't know how you do it. And I think that was a very fair point. Here, we have no difficulties in labeling everyone. <laughs> Isn't it? And the problem with the Islamic enactment start with that. It starts with the definition of Muslim. And that definition, as some of the lawyers have said, does not accord with the definition under the Constitution, which is a person possessing. So the definition of enactment goes further. A person born to a Muslim parent. Right? So it goes beyond that. And that definition then runs counter to the freedom. I, I take your point. But the freedom that the Constitution speaks of. So in all of that, coming back to the topic, one of the views that I find most compelling is that if you look at the role of the state as an honest broker to just guard the neutral space that society needs to, to uh, develop, then the, the state plays the role of umpire. And that space has to be neutral. That is what secular means. And it is that space that is going to allow for Islam to flourish as much as it will allow Islam to coincide with other religions in this country. Because when you have a neutral space without the state intervening, then there will not be labeling, there will not be defining. There will be a wider space for us to each believe what we think is right, subject to the restrictions of, of, of legislation or action, that, not legislation of action, that counter public order. Now, if you say to me, that that Shia community is pro proving problematic because it's firebombing the Shafi'i mosque in Tamantun, then you should put them in jail because they are interfering in public order. But if the Shafi'i Muslims from Tamantun say, my world is disturbed because there are Shias living in Klang, <laughs> then I'm sorry, la, you know, get a life. <laughs> you know, so, but unfortunately, we've allowed that second view to become the prevailing view. I don't like what's happening in that building right now where these people are sitting down talking about freedom of Islam, of religion. We should stop them. Even though we're in this closed room with no interference outside, we're not stopping traffic, we're not doing anything. But somehow that sort of lopsided view of the world has become the way in which we, we regulate ourselves. Not just in this thing, but in other things as well. So that's what this topic actually means, I think. And there's a really good book by a, by a very, very eminent uh, a scholar called Abdullah Hiya Naim, who now teaches at Emory. And Naim is, is interesting because he, he had to flee Sudan. His guru, his teacher, uh, was uh, uh, an advocate of moderate ideas. And uh, Naim fled because he saw his teacher being killed by the state because of his views. So Naim fled and left, went to um, um, the States, went to Harvard, if I'm not mistaken, and then became a, a professor at Emory. And he's written this amazing book about the need to have secular space for not just 
society, but for Islam. And I was fortunate enough to have the name as a tutor in one of my uh, uh, degrees. And really, the mind there is, is amazing in terms of its conception, its compassion, and so on. But when those kinds of people come here, they are perceived to be enemies of the state because of their views, which are held to be too radical, not because of the ideas that might come in connection with the religion, but in the way it undermines the control dimension of, of the society. Thank you. Um, there's one boy at the back. Just no, ah, okay. Oh, okay. There's one orang asli. Uh, we we had uh, Shafi, um, and then after that, uh, the the gentleman in the glass. Yeah. Oh, the other at the back. Yes. Okay, Shafi. Shafi is an orang asli. <laughs> Hi. Selamat uh, tinggal. <coughs> Nama saya Shafi Idris. Uh, bukan Melayu. Orang asli. <laughs> Namun pinjam. Uh, saya nak tanya uh, beberapa soalan. Uh, isunya macam ni. Uh, kebanyakan orang asli uh, perlu Islam uh, secara paksa lah. Pertama, uh, daripada mula sekolah, sejak tahun lima, dibawa oleh cikgu untuk ajar cara Islam lah. Dan diislamkan oleh satu ustaz di kes Kelantan lah. Yang kedua, uh, ada satu jabatan. Apa jabatan? Uh, apa tu? Pendakwah uh, Dakwah orang asli uh, Katanya kalau masuk Islam Kamu jadi kaya Dan uh, dapat bantuan 500 satu tahun tercap raya Dan apabila Lama-lama kelamaan Mungkin dikira hanya 3 tahun saja dapat bantuan Lepas tu tak ada dah Dan dia eh, rasa terperangkap Dan mahu balik semula ke rumah asal dia lah Soalan saya Bolehkah kes-kes seperti ini Bawa ke mahkamah dan bagaimanakah cara cara dia proses dia untuk bawa kes seperti ini sebab mereka bukan rela tapi dipaksa kalau jadi kaya lah kalau kamu di Islam jadi bersih lah jadi mereka ini uh, terpedaya dengan uh, pedawah-pedawah dan sekarang mereka dah sedar dan banyak soalan mereka tanya dekat saya apabila pergi ke kampung-kampung saya pun tak tahu saya bukan kuang jadi inilah masanya saya tanya pada tuan-tuan semua Apakah cara dia untuk keluar dari Islam itu? Adakah peluang untuk menang sekiranya bawa kes ke mahkamah? Tengok itu sekali masih. Terima kasih Syafi'i. Uh, uh, apa dia? Mm, ya, yeah, um, just to say that uh, this is quite common problem uh, amongst the orang asli uh, in, uh, with being converted to Islam with Swedes, you know, telling them this and that. But and then uh, sometimes their name being changed unilaterally uh, without their knowledge uh, into bin instead of anak lelaki or anak perempuan and suddenly become bin and binti. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, kita kongsi eh? <laughs> So yang yang saya tahu ya Cik Syafiq eh? Hanya mahkamah tinggi syariah Dia boleh berurusan okay. Dan permohonan di mahkamah tinggi syariah tu Kalau di Selangor <coughs> It should be under permohonan Because dia tu set summon or permohonan Very unfortunate Pasal dalam schedule kedua Anaiman Selangor Permohonan untuk siar kuat Islam tak ada So, kena patah balik pada summon Masalah summon sekarang ni ialah Apa dia cost of action When you say summon, what is the cost of action? There's no cost of action Because it's merely application Just a declaration Bahawa pentadbiran, eh, enactment pentadbiran agama Islam Selangor uh, Section 61 of the court The court can declare Someone is no more Muslim Can declare Mereka just sikit dia We need that itu kuasa yang mahkamah ada untuk buat satu deklarasi seseorang tu bukan lagi seorang Islam ok, tapi proses macam mana kena melalui saman bila go for saman plaintiff, Cik Syafiq ni kena establish you punya facts you punya claim right macam ni nak claim, sedangkan dia tak ada hal dengan orang lain you know, that's, a, that's a dilemma now bila kita argue kat mahkamah we go for saman Why is the conservation against the state? Why? Because it's my religion. It's me. And my apply. Right? 
Uh, that's uh, one nak kunas itu lah. However, however, the Sharia Court try to accommodate. So, Cik Syafi kena apply melalui saman, state down your statement of claim, and you sue Malaysia Agama Islam of the state. Not Jabatan Agama, not Jabatan Pendara Negara, no. But Malaysia Agama. Because under the enactment tak beran agama, Malaysia Agama Islam is the head of all everything lah. Uh, Cik Abdul Qadir, uh, sama ke cara ni? Is it the same thing in Kelantan, let's say? Yes. Same oh, procedure? Semua, semua sama. Semua sama. So, uh, only said Johor is not, tak suka sangat nak dengar. Johor bel belum tak timbul dengan kes-kes ni so far. So far, kes banyak di sana kat Penang dah ada banyak. Selangor baru dua kes Selangor. Wilayah KL dah banyak ada. Negeri Seminan dah banyak. Melaka pun dah banyak. Except Kelantan, saya tak dengar lagi. Terangu belum, paham belum. Johor tak boleh masuk langsung you cannot apply <laughs> I don't know why okay tapi prosesnya gitu and you go for your statement of penalty you can approve lah you punya you, your witnesses you bring your witnesses all the procedure they, they try to accommodate macam normal application okay and another part of the majlis they going to object as our malik minta said why you don't object in the reality how to object if you believe in Islam so be it lah But still, they want to object. Alright? So, let them be like that. Okay, so, the next step is that the Malays will apply for you for go for counseling. Meaning that, you attend a few sessions with them, talking about religion, and each session will take about one or two hours. And ah, take... Cakap Melayu, uh, Encik Kadir, because dia tak paham-paham sangat ah, bahasa Inggeris. Okay, Jadi, Encik Syafi, maknanya, uh, pihak Malays akan memohon pada mahkamah, Encik Syafi kena pergi satu sesi ataupun sepuluh sesi cakap pasal agama okay. lepas sesi tu kelengkap dia buat satu report dan report tu kata ni confidential ok mahkamah anda kena kat sumpah dan dia kisah personally uh, peribadi pada hakim tapi kat luar mahkamah sana dia landscape dia tulis dia sulit tapi faham faham ni lah kan <laughs> so dengan, dengan laporan tu tadi sepatutnya hakim ada satu Perspektif ada satu pandangan tu tak Cik Syafi Dalam diri dia Okay, for his knowledge Faham eh? Kemudian we go for trial Kita pergi bicara Cik Syafi cerita Cik Syafi ni atas belakang Bawa saksi, bawa bukti uh, Malaysia akan challenge And order, um, ujungnya Akim akan cakap lah Saya puas hati Cik Syafi Memanglah Cik Syafi ni nama dia Islam Dan you masa Islam pasal dipaksa Atau macam Macam istilah macam dipropogi Ataupun macam kan ada tipu tapi macam janjinya tak tak benar lah ha, ha, macam tu lah jadi hakim puas hati hakim uh, istiar hari ni Cik Syafi Cik Syafi bukan lagi seorang Islam it's two different mana dua kat dalam beza kalau itu Cik Syafi murtad lain like. kalau itu Cik Syafi murtad mesti hukum bunuh ha, itu tak tahu payah pasal, tak payah pasal kalau kata murtad mesti hukum bunuh tapi kalau kata istiar Cik Syafi bukan lagi seorang Islam is Maknanya everybody accept mana semua orang terima mana Cik Syafi memang bukan Islam Bukan? Pasal murtad kan? Itu tadi saya tak pakai istilah murtad Pasal murtad ni kalau ikut uh, cara proses bicara tu Memang teliti Sampai tanya keturunan dia Apa dia buat, apa dia buat teliti every day It's not just simply oh you murtad no tak boleh Can not? Dia, dan dia punya bicara murtad tu Sampai kata orang tu memang confirm lah You murtad Memang confirm lah Memang, memang confirm murtad ah, then, To that sampai level tu uh, Ada ke provision di dalam syariah Laws kita mengatakan uh, Murtad akan dihukum bunuh Tak ada Tak ada eh Undang-undang uh, murtad pun tak ada Undang-undang uh, I mean law Undang-undang murtad tu uh, tak, ada, tak ada No provision uh, there's, no, there's no law uh, Can I ask uh, This is my personal question uh, This uh, syariah laws yang kita ada Di setiap negara uh, Negeri sekarang ni Adakah mengikut uh, Al-Quran sebab kalau kita kata syariah tu mesti ikut Quran kan uh, adakah undang-undang yang sekarang kita ada sekarang ni sebenarnya ikut Al-Quran uh, pasal apa Al-Quran ni uh, dia bagi benda yang fundamental dia tak detail out tapi fundamental kemudian detail detail out ni dengan Nabi Muhammad lah mana dengan sunnah dia mana kehidupan Nabi Muhammad SAW tu dia dapat sampai dia wafat dia detail out macam ni dapat. Okey macam kes uh, kes murtad ni ada dalam zaman Nabi Muhammad ada kes murtad. Memang ada. Okey. 
Dan kes tu maknanya mengatakan Nabi Muhammad panggil A tu Dan tanya kenapa dia nak murtad Dan dia list downkan semua Semua orang dengar Yang dengar ni is not common people Bukan orang macam biasa Tapi orang yang tahu agama Orang yang tahu letak belakang bangsa Orang tahu letak komuniti tu Macam kata Cik Syafiq orang asli kan Buat apa? Senai ke uh, Dai apa Jakun ke apa dia tahu Okay. Jadi maknanya dalam Malaysia syariah ni okay, Kalau dia kata fully, totally fully ikut Quran Dia mix sekarang ni Okay, okay. Oh, okay. Thank you very much sir. It's just that now uh, we we just take What, how many to What Now so many pula uh, <laughs> No, I know the boy, uh, sorry boy no, the, the, the guy at the back has been uh, putting up his hand Yes, quickly uh, Now uh, And um, the lady, the girl there, the, the, the young lady there, uh, and then Azlan. Um, if we have time, then, uh, you know, uh, the, the guy in the glass there, yeah. We will give chance to people who haven't asked questions yet. Okay, please okay. go ahead. Uh, thank you, panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm Jo Kwan. And uh, just now, I very agree that on the, actually the law and the constitution always as I see and uh, Ben you see, it's, it's quite okay, it's been quite, quite, uh, quite secular uh, a bit of religion, it's quite okay. Just that the execution is, is, is messed up and the uh, judiciary is messed up and, and point out that it's a uh, political will that, that can make the ex uh, executions uh, make it right. And that will, of course, uh, uh, about pol politics and uh, and politics is uh, about the uh, people choice and uh, so it, it come back a big round and the uh, people choice and uh, so and um, so but as for I see now uh, on 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 so the, you have a question or you yeah, yeah. for for the populations people choice uh, so uh, you your opinion is uh, now currently the the mass the general population choice is is, is how is is, is pro this or that or, or what? Okay, uh, you want to know what what are uh, the the rakyat wants right now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what the panel uh, thinks? Uh, yes. Okay, that's your call. Can we have the next question? We take all together. Uh, the young lady, please. Yeah, you can stand behind her. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Aida. Uh, still, I'm still studying. Uh, so please forgive me if you think I give silly questions. Okay. Uh, do you think it's right or do you think it's appropriate that just because one person converted into Islam, okay, let's say he's a Chinese, then he converted to Islam. You know, by the definition of federal constitution, constitution uh, a Malay uh, by definition is actually He's a Muslim, and then uh, by second definition, he is practicing the customs of a Malay, of a Muslim. So do you think it's actually right if, let's say, a Chinese convert to Islam, therefore he must change his race to to become a Malay? Do you think it's actually we are actually committing social injustice by doing that? Because of, let's say, maybe I am a Malay, but I don't want to just uh, be Muslim simply because I am a Malay. So yeah, that's my question. Do you think it's right for me, for us to actually do that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The next question. Uh, <coughs> uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Victor Chin, and uh, I was uh, going to pick up on what uh, Malik said about our government should be neutral. <coughs> I think it's the heart of the matter here. How do you keep? Uh, a government or the, uh, as our constitution, pretty neutral. I want to ask the panel, uh, how can we have, uh, how can we introduce policies which will then limit uh, the, the, the propaganda of religion, such as the Islam or Christian or Buddhist or any other religion? How can we protect our constitution with this onslaught of Islamization, which is happening now, which is what we're discussing, and how can we sort of protect, or how can we prevent uh, schools, uh, institutions from being uh, overwhelmed uh, by a monolithic uh, religion like Islam here? 
of course, religion is very important for all of us who we are various religions, but how could we tame it? How could we have a policy which we can contain it and in, if, if possible, reduce it so that it allows uh, individual the freedom to choose, for example, and our government being neutral? Thank you. Hello, hi, uh, my name is Aslan. Uh, well, my question, well, in response to the question of whether or not the constitution is secular as opposed to it being Islamic, well, when we talk about the secular state, it um, simply excludes any iota of religious features um, in the structure of uh, the constitution as a whole. And maybe when we speak about the uh, Islamic state, that would then include the Quran, and, and that would actually put the Quran, you know, in the highest constitutional pedestal. So having said that, um, is it safe to say that our constitution is neither Islamic nor secular? Is it safe to just say that it's neither? And with that said, is it, is it also safe to say that we actually, or the constitution actually walks on the middle path? And the second question, if I could just ask further, this is a very short one. If I could just ask um, everyone to revisit Article 11 of the federal constitution where every person has the right to profess and practice his religion. So in the minds of the panels, are you of the opinion that his, the, the, the very word his actually refers to the religion of his birth or religion of his choice? And um, yeah, what do you make of either side's of arguments? Thank you. Okay, um, we'll get the answers from the panel now. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I think now the joke one question was, <coughs> what, what, <coughs> excuse me, um, what do you think about the public's uh, sentiment right now? Uh, are they for secular or Islamic? Well, I think if, if you go by uh, the Malay majority, and I think this rise of Islamic consciousness that's happening um, all around, arguably I would say that there is a, perhaps a, a desire for sort of an Islamic state. Uh, but I think probably that's because they're not told that there are probably, that there is an alternative way of looking for all of that without sacrificing all your rights. Because I, I don't think the, the notion of uh, an Islamic state is actually Islamic in the first place. Yeah? So they're just being sold that idea, perhaps to mask the inadequacies of the state in terms of governance. And I think that, that, that perhaps is something that we need to recognize. The, the real issue is not so much um, anything but you have the state being weak in terms of its administration, in terms of uh, dealing with corruption, um, and, and I think that just selling something to the public to say that, look, that's the way to solve all of this. And in fact, actually, that's not the way to solve all of, all of that, yeah? Um, I want to come back to Aslan's question. Um, when you asked the question of whether the constitution is secular or non-secular, or whether it's a hybrid sort of uh, constitution, yeah? Um, <laughs> You can say the constitution is a hybrid constitution. You can say the constitution is secular. You can say the constitution is quasi-secular. I don't think really it makes any difference. Yeah, th because those are just labels. I think what's more important that we need to ask is what are the rights that we have? And I think the important thing to take away from this talk today is the fact that the state cannot take away fundamental liberties from you. Doesn't matter what they say. It can be Rivina, It can be you know FNN. It can be Coke. It can be Pepsi. It doesn't matter. What you must be aware of is you have rights under the Constitution. If you wish to profess a particular faith, that's your right as a citizen. If you wish to speak on something related to Islam, it is your right as, as, a, as a citizen. A state cannot say that just because it relates to something about Islam, you must get a taulia, a certificate. Then you can speak. Because that allows them to then decide whether to give the tawliyah to you or not. Even if you are a mufti or, or a formal mufti, as in the case of uh, Mufti Asri from Perlis, yeah? So I think what we need to recognize is there are all these rights that's, that's actually given to us under the Constitution. So it doesn't matter whether it is a, uh, in relation to an Islamic matter or not. It is your rights. Um, 
Um, the, the young lady asked about is it is it um, just uh, to get people to convert into Islam when they want to get married, uh, you know, and therefore they become Malay. And social, justice. social justice, whether it's just just, isn't that what you meant? Yes. Uh, what do you think of the conversion? Uh, Well, um, frankly, the idea that you have to become Malay in order to become Muslim is a bit strange to me. <laughs> because I don't think you need to abandon wholesale who you were, who you are, just to profess a particular faith. Yeah? Um, and I don't think it, it, it's just confined to Islam, even if you, are, you, know, if, if you want to profess the religion of Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever it is. It doesn't mean that you have to abandon who you are. Um, you don't even, in fact, you don't even have to change your name, strictly speaking. Um, I, I know one particular Gujarati who's, who's, who goes by the name of Shah Kirit, which is, which is his actual name. He didn't change his name. You don't have to change your name. As long as the name means something good, you can retain whatever that, that, that you are called from birth. So it doesn't matter. I think the next question was about the how to move forward. Uh, yes, I just comment. Uh, I think I think Malik made a very important point just now uh, regarding your question. I mean, uh, the issue is that our constitution defines how how our constitution defines a Malay, right? You must be a Muslim, but doesn't mean that if you want to convert out of Islam, if you are Malay and convert out of Islam, then you are going to lose your rights, your Malay rights. You can't get. 10% uh, discount when you buy <laughs> houses and things like that, you know. So it's more of uh, uh, basically it's into these matters rather than uh, changing your race altogether, you know, right? If you're Chinese, doesn't mean that you have to become a Malay. You're still a Chinese, but you can be a Muslim, right? So, but of course, they will, in terms of uh, you have the, the right to get all these kind of privileges, yeah, discounts and things like that. Which, which I don't think that it should be, you know. Yes. I, I would like the panel to answer uh, Victor Chin's uh, question because that is really one uh, uh, one other question which is quite similar. How do we move forward? Uh, you know, what can uh, we do to improve the situation? about addressing the perception of Malay special status. I think if you address that and you eliminate the need for people to think in terms of Malay supremacy, um, a uh, perspective of uh, equality will, will, will settle over everything. See, right now, there's a need to constantly project aspects of a particular ethnic uh, group the Malays, uh, to constantly underscore this us and them. All right? That's what we're seeing. One of the ways in which that is manifested is the emphasis on Islam in the public sphere. So, we have to go back, I think, to the question of why it is there's a need in the minds of some for this us and them. You get me, Victor? Because what we have right now is this rhetoric that started in the 80s about Ketuanan Melayu, which has no constitutional underpinnings. One of the key features of being a Malay is being Muslim. So by projecting constantly this Islamic uh, dimension to things and defending it even at the cost of being considered insensitive, intolerant, and so on, which is part of the dialectic we're seeing around us, um, it's a way of saying, don't worry, this is us. <coughs> so, if we're going to address this need to reintroduce neutrality into the public sphere, then I think we have to ask ourselves, what are the divisive factors, and what do we need to do to, to um, uh, dilute these factors, or to, under, um, to eradicate these factors? 
So one of the ideas we've been working on is, is something called the Social Inclusion uh, Act idea. Um, it's online on the Saya Anak Bangsa Malaysia website. And this, this idea that if you look at um, attempts to try and deal with poverty in this country, and um, you know the, the statistics on poverty are very interesting for those of you who are uh, following this issue, because when you look at the truth of it, poverty doesn't recognize race according to the statistics. And actually, the community that's most poor are the Orang Asli and Orang Asal. But if you look at Malay, Chinese, Indian, and, and others, uh, between the Malays, Chinese, and Indians, it's about the same, um, the stats. But what we're seeing is an increase in poverty and a widening of the poverty cap, which is then resulting in um, ultra or fascist um, tendencies to try and say, look, this is us. It's a claim to power. Okay, so, but just, just, just by way of interest, um, the, the government put a poverty line at about 763 ringgit for a family of five living in the peninsula. And that covers eight indicators. Um, food, clothing, shelter, uh, housing, food, clothing, shelter, uh, medical, education, recreation, and two other things I can't remember offhand. Family of five is expected to survive at 763 a month in, Penin in anywhere in Peninsula Malaysia. If you have that money, you're not considered hardcore poor. <laughs> okay? For, uh, for East Malaysia, it's 793 ringgit. Okay. If you apply that yardstick, poverty is, that means above that, la, it's 3.1%. That's the figure that the government talks about all the time. 3.1. Near the last election, it suddenly dropped miraculously to about 1.8, I think. Okay. Now, if you apply the figure of 1,500 ringgit, or about that, to the same figure, uh, to the same uh, community, what you're looking at is poverty in the region of about 38% of the country. Now, if you apply 3,000 ringgit, which is what they are saying you're qualified for brim, if you have 3,000 and less. It's about 67 to 68% of the country. That is the real uh, dynamic we're dealing with. And we can't be talking about these issues without addressing that context. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier, that if we don't look at the core issues as to why these people need to define themselves by religion in the way that we do here, and just dismiss it as nothing more than the religious or spiritual dimension of a particular individual, without looking at the contextual relationship we're ignoring this very real factor that people will move as they are. They feel compelled to, based on their need to cling to some idea that they are relevant to their society around them. And that's why you have the, the headmasters who go around telling little girls of six that you can't wear shorts because, you know, six-year-old girls are obviously, I don't know, what? It's crazy when you think about what it is that they're saying without saying it, you know? Um, or the fact that People are expected to, to say doa, regardless of the sensitivities of other people. We weren't like that as a community before. But what's making us that way? We can't just say it's about politics. There are real forces driving us that way. And that's what we need to address. So if you ask me, how do we deal with it? It's an extremely complex problem that starts with us addressing fundamentals. That, and that starts with a, a, a poverty eradication system that is effective. One that does not allow for leakages, corruption, uh, one that actually addresses problems on the ground from a ground up way, allocating through the MPs and the aduns, finding out what needs to be done, so on and so forth. That's the idea that we've put across. And just as just before the last election, the only parties that came out with any open support of it was PSM, uh, DAP to some extent, PKR kept quiet, PAS kept quiet, none of the Barisan parties came forward to say anything about it. I'm sorry, but that's the that's the best I can say in response to, to your comment. Yeah. I have nothing further to say. I think I've, I've well, no, I think we are wrapping up now. Um, um, no, I think uh, it's already like uh, been a long time, so maybe we can share it, uh, uh, you know, informally. So we are wrapping up this uh, talk now, and uh, we hope that um, all the participants uh, have 
uh, gain some knowledge or you know can bring back something with you and you know if anyone talks to you about the constitution maybe you have you can actually now yes I know about something so uh, with that um, I uh, we have some little gifts uh, from did I mention um, that the mark, there is lunch after this? Uh, and thank you very much uh, to the donators. Uh, uh, some of them um, uh, do, do not want to be mentioned, but I think uh, Mr. Uh, doctor, the doctor just now, uh, he's one of the contributor. He doesn't want, he doesn't mind because yes. Uh, he very kindly donated uh, quite a good sum of money, and um, because he promotes the idea of uh, uh, talk about uh, the constitution and uh, promote about uh, the secular idea as well, so so that people will know what is secu secular uh, country. So with that, can we? Um, yeah. Oh, see. Yes. Uh, okay, gentlemen, you want to makan or not? Come, let's go <laughs> get this over and done with. Yes, uh, thank you very, very much, Malay. Yes, thank you. And Nizam, thank you very much for your explanation. It's been really great. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, give a big round of applause for our speakers. Uh, they have been really very informative and wonderful. And uh, thank you to all of you who are coming. And we hope to do more of this kind of talk. Uh, please come again. Uh, I'm not sure, come promise there will be food, but there is food now. Go and makan. Thank you. Thank you very much.